Long time ago, I've been wanting to do a triathlon. I just like to put these far-fetched challenges on my bucket list and let's see how far I can at least get. The best part is trying to get up a hill that you've never done or trying to get up it at a certain pace because that's where you know you're being put to the challenge. You can't get to go down the hill without going up, so you gotta be grateful for that. You know, I try to create myself a certain destination to get and come back. So it's like, if I'm not done, I'm not done until I'm done, and then that's when I can fully rest. I just always have a sense of wanting to see how far I can go with myself and whatever it is that I do. There you go, we're rolling. Can you actually believe it or not? Yeah. I did this one time where I forgot to roll on the audio. We went through a whole podcast. You had no audio for the yeah. whole podcast? <laughs> yeah. So what did you do? You, you ADR'd it? Or no, you, you just said you had to come back a second time. <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was no audio on the recorder here. And I had, didn't have the audio turned on on this the camera. You do. This is what you do. You put a different language. So <laughs> the syncing doesn't matter. Oh, Subtitles man. and you're good. <laughs> no, but it's just, it amazes me sometimes, you know, as long as I've been doing the video thing. Uh-huh. I'll still have basic fuck-ups like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, every now I mean, and then you know you have you, to think you, about so many things though. or like you know you there's that common mistake where you think you press record but you really press stop right and then in between the takes is when it was recording right you're like fucking super simple mistakes like that it's unbelievable for audio there's a audio recorder that i have and for that one you have to press record twice the first one's standby and the second one's to record uh-huh. and Starting out when using that device, I would always just hit it once. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm hearing it. I'm like, okay, good. We're good. And then we continue. And then I go back and I see the thing blinking. And there's no time code going. So then it's like, again, so what, like what, what, do you, what do you do in that point? Do you admit that you fucked up? Yeah, or do you sure. just say, you know what? Let's just do another take for safety and well, for play sure it off you gotta like you did admit that up. you made a mistake, you know? That way you can learn from it. But uh, it's up to, it depends. Like sometimes, like in your instance, it's like, it's too late to do another take. Like you have to, it's going to be like a whole nother one hour, two hour session for your case. Yeah, uh, you, in some other cases, it wouldn't be that bad. Like, you, you know, for me, film. like I've, I've definitely, you know, messed up like that on set before and other people shoots. And I always gauge it. It depends on the environment on the suit where you feel like mm-hmm. not necessarily that we're there cool with mistakes. I mean, you don't want to make mistakes, but they understand that mistakes happen. Right, right, and let's right. just do it again because sometimes you work with other people and they're they're just tyrants uh-huh. and so you like you don't want to admit it you'll just play it off you know what let's just do another one just to be safe mm-hmm. have you ever been in that position before where i had to like not where yeah well you just you worked with tyrants where you know that you know it's just not that kind of environment where it's mm. not it's not cohesive to people being forthcoming and being honest and mm-hmm. I mean, and not not in film yet, but like when it comes to like other work environments, like I've been working with people and they won't admit to mistakes that they made. And then once we speak to our supervisor, they'd ask like, oh, so what happened or, or what's going on? And then that person makes an excuse to like cover it up. And for me, I'm just like, well we just got to be honest just let them know that way they know what's going on and then if we get in trouble we get in trouble but this is what happened that way so you've never had a problem admitting when you've made when you fucked up for me no no i mean i just think like it's the best thing to be like responsible and honest and it's like they you can't really be punished for for admitting that, oh, you can, that a mistake though. you well, can well i mean i'm sure you can but <laughs> you, then it's like you totally can it's like it's like if I need to be punished, then then so be it. But but it's just like in the moment, I'd rather be the one uh, getting the blame on me because I'm the one responsible versus like trying to pin it on somebody else once it uh, comes well, around. I guess you know because this is something I've definitely struggled with, like 
my whole life and it's something I've been improving on over time and time again. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't necessarily say I try to pin the blame on someone else. Mm, I think that's but, where you're but, going with it. I'm no, just no, 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 no. <laughs> but it's more so, like I said, I just try to be sneaky with, oh, let's just do another one yeah, 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 see, just in I case. See. But I think that's definitely the way to go, admitting you're, you're wrong and you messed up. But would, right. Are would, you referring to like film when like something... Oh, yeah, yeah, don't... film. Oh, to me, yeah. I mean, film especially because... Uh, it, it can be such a high pressure environment right. and then depending on who the director is or who the ad is the kind of the environment they create on set mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they can make it even more high pressure than it has to be right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so in those kind of situations mm-hmm. you kind of really just don't want to like slow like things down yeah, yeah. You, so you're gonna find another way to really kind of cover yourself and just do it again mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but that's honestly it's not the smart thing to do no because at the end like, of the day like yeah. let's say let's say bite you in the ass and somebody saw what you did and oh you didn't do, and then you say it wasn't me and then yeah. it just comes back at you as no, a yeah, liar yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah, you no. don't want to be seen as that no no it's definitely bitten me in the ass like i've never denied it mm-hmm. but i've always you know my tendency was, okay, let's try to find a way to fix it so that right. no one ever no, knows yeah, yeah. that I fucked up. Yeah, and you don't have to admit it unless there needs to be a moment of No, I, I think, I think you, you know do need I mean? to admit it, though. I think that's the best thing to do because in terms of your own personal self-growth, right? Right, right, right. I think that's kind that's of true. the key yeah. part of it is right. admitting it in the first place. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, uh, you know, as old as I am, it's kind of hard to believe. You know, they still <laughs> struggle with these things, still trying to grow up. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a hard lesson to, to learn. <laughs> Apparently but, not for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you have to you have to come at it at whatever stage in your life. Well, so but, what do you have a hard time with? Right? There's got to be something that you struggle with like that. That I struggle with yeah. when it comes to, I mean, I just want to be better than I was yesterday. So, that, uh, so nothing. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I. I just have trouble with like just trying to do my best in something. So sometimes like I'll do something and I'll be like, oh, that's good enough. And then I'll just move on. So ah. that's something I, I struggle with a lot because then it's like it, that's why I like this collaborative uh, community or profession because it's like I'll have something prepped or assembled and whatever. And then I send it to somebody or show it to somebody else and then their perspective like changes it it makes it even better and then that's where i'm just like i don't know i just feel like i just end up like putting myself in a that's good enough type of mindset but then like i realize like i need to keep adjusting to like make it better and better you don't strike me as that kind of person at all like in my interactions with you Mm -hmm. i mean because they've been mostly filmmaking right Mm -hmm. i mean they've been purely filmmaking yeah so like i I would never have thought that about you at all Mm -hmm. Now I'm kind of second guessing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I but mean, really, so what kind of things do you do that with? I'm assuming not anything filmmaking related. No, yeah. I mean, like in my films in general, like, uh, for example, I just did a, a music video and we're in the process of releasing it soon. But in the process of assembling it, I put it together and I'm like, oh, this is really great. And this is good. And so that's with the, without having like my fellow collaborators to like, dive or like have their perspective and and point out things that are missing i would be like satisfied and then i would submit it but that's the thing where it's like i need to be more critical and like observe more but but i think it's also hard for one person to fully see the scope of the film without having an outside perspective coming in and like pointing out the the blind spots that year well, you're a lot further along with that music video than i expected because when we were talking about it when we did the location scouts for your yeah. intro for this you were thinking more summer that it was going to be released but it looks like you've oh, already made decent progress we're it. done with it honestly really like, so yeah. what happened you were expecting like june or something that you, you were gonna be able to get to it right yeah the plan was to like think about like maybe releasing it like during summer and stuff like that but we shot it uh let's say on the i think the second of april or the third of april and then like a week and a half later i assembled it and i was like well we're just there already so then i already got in contact with a friend of mine who started helping me illustrate a invitation poster i got somebody to color it once it was done coloring we just got the trailer done and got the trailer out and so we we're just like eager to just like get it out there to everybody so they can see it the song has been out since like i think february i think it came out on valentine's day 
or like a little bit after Valentine's Day, but we are now just like pretty much set and we're just gonna be like waiting until next week yeah next really week. Uh, her name is bebo yes right? her, her real name is sabrina Venegas, but she goes by bebo yeah her voice is amazing it's her not what i was is, expecting at all dude it's great you told me you had this young friend who sings so I yeah. was, well i was expecting something more like hip-hoppy just like kind of r&b but mm -hmm. it's how would you describe it? It's almost like, like um, Amy Winehouse, yeah. like right. I was, mm -hmm. I was really digging the song. I was right. Like, so me and Sabrina, we met through my cousin, and she went to school with my cousin, and she would be invited to family parties and stuff like that, and then she would sing sometimes. And so, at the family parties, sometimes, yeah. And then, how does that even come about? You're huh? at a family party. I mean, just... I mean, you know, like sometimes we like to do karaoke, and so then karaoke. Uh, are would you come guys up Filipino? Then, <laughs> we're not Filipino. We're Mexican. <laughs> but when it comes to Mexicans, when there's like a banda and stuff like that, like people just tend to like <laughs> sing out loud. Like we don't need a mic. Type of thing. Like everyone has their turn when singing. But uh, but no, yeah. So we we got in touch like a while back, and then I, 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 for me personally, when I heard her sing, I'm like, oh man, this is great. For me, I wasn't at nowhere close to where I am now in my film uh, skill set, and but I knew that like hopefully in the future like we can collaborate and work together. And then um, up until now, she uh, she made her mix for her song Swept, and she came to me and she's like. I honestly can't think of anybody else who I want to collaborate with. And I was like, yes, like this would be an honor. And we were going to do a really great job, I promise. And she was like, let's do it on my garage. And like, hell yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so that was, she wanted to like, obviously when it comes to like starting out, you want to like do whatever you can to save a buck. But I knew the potential in her song. A lot of people know the potential in her song. And uh, sh the first idea was like, uh, the idea came up of like doing it in in a garage, and I was just like, no, like, like we can't we can't do it in a garage. Come on, like I have so many resources, and and at the same time, on top of that, like I kind of have this vision that it's like uh, the look that we're trying to achieve, and and for the the theme of it, I don't think um, trying to be low budget would be uh, the right way to go about it. Yeah, but I mean, we I've, did save a lot of money. I've only seen, you know, the the little teasers that you put out mm -hmm. on Instagram, but I would say it does seem to suit the song, mm -hmm. especially her voice very well. It's kind of like got this 1930s, 40s yeah. kind of vibe to it, right? Yeah, we played kind homage the, to the 1920s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1930s. So it uh, fits her, that song and her voice perfectly. I, mm -hmm. I can't wait to see it. Man. Oh, yeah. I'm excited for it. Can, can you listen to the song anywhere right you now? Can send, you, you can hear it right now on Spotify, iTunes. It's on Instagram if you end up You just like, type in Bebo. And type swept. in Bebo and Swept and you'll come up with the and song that's B -E -E -B -O. and that's B-E-E-B-O yes it is what's the story um, behind that name do you know I can't remember she told me something but I, I don't want to I don't want to say the story <laughs> because I just I just completely forgot you don't want to fuck up. it up yeah I don't want to make up this <laughs> random story and then just like that being the way people think <laughs> the name comes about so no I won't say anything you see what a good man he is ladies yeah, and gentlemen I lose my admits memory. when he's wrong and he yeah. doesn't know things mm -hmm. he doesn't want to talk out of turn when he doesn't really know the whole thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are you a good person or I mean that's just the way it should be <laughs> it should be that way but yeah. you know what it's hard for for a lot of people to be that way mm -hmm. I myself mm -hmm. included it took me a while to you you know, get to that point where I felt comfortable admitting when I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I still struggle with admitting when I don't know things. Actually, I don't struggle with it. It really depends on what the environment is. Mm -hmm. It's tough to do it on a set. Mm -hmm. Especially like when you're usually, I'm usually the one in charge, right? And people usually right. look for you for answers. Mm -hmm. You know, someone looks to you for an answer and you're in charge. It's kind of hard to say, oh, well, I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, so, and then especially even like, Back when I was still freelance, you know, you never want to, you never want people to look at you as if you don't know what you're doing, right? Because right. you want people, you know, to think that you're a professional and mm -hmm. you're competent, you want to mm -hmm. be hired again. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, you're really just shooting yourself in the foot. Cause no, exactly. I think what's noble about people, it's like, you know, having that humility to like admit that, you know, you don't know anything or something. But, but what makes it more noble is that you're willing to show that you can figure it out that you can try to make your way to understand what it is that you don't know okay so 
when you you've directed quite a few projects at this point has anyone ever fucked up big time on one of your shoots um i can't think of anything but when it comes to like making mistakes when it comes to like not achieving the task like let's say an actor can't say their lines in time or like someone not being able to shoot the the video at the right uh way you want it i mean i haven't been hard on anybody i mean this whole thing is like a learning process and thank god for editing we can make it work <laughs> <laughs> for the most part yeah, right the things you and can it's do. it's like you know we can't we can't really be too hard on each other for like at least trying our best you know like if there's someone who's just like being very ignorant or like not really trying to like respect the department or to respect the the project itself then then that's where things um can turn sideways but i know that the people that i usually like to work with are people who want to like give it their all and have respect for one another so see that's exactly the kind of environment that i'm talking about right and that mm -hmm. kind of environment mm -hmm. it makes it easy to admit that you don't know something or mm -hmm. you did something wrong mm -hmm. Because you know, as long as you're really trying to learn and you're trying to do right. your best, it's going to mm -hmm. be understood. Okay, let's do it better. This is how you do it. And let's mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. Instead of just being chewed out no, I and mean, made you feel like a piece of crap. I mean, the, the big thing that, that I enjoyed in working on film sets, and a majority have been like film sets for like student film projects and, and people like closer to um, the same stage of where I'm at when mm -hmm. it comes to the department that everyone has been very humble and willing to teach even though you don't know anything because for me i haven't been I, I mean i've been on productions and stuff like that where i just didn't know what what terminology was being used i didn't know the the name of equipment and gear but i wasn't ashamed to like ask like oh hey like i know you told me to go get this but i don't know what i honestly is. don't know what that is yeah and then they'll be like they'll have patience to, to, to take a step back and, and describe it to me. So I guess the benefits that these were student projects and stuff like that. Even so it's kind of lower pressure. Basically. Yeah, I guess like there was like Zero a lower pressure, pressure. If you really think about it, right? Right. There is. And I, and I'm sure I'm, I'm fortunate enough to like be learning these things through student projects. And I think just like independent projects in general, like we're, we're all out here trying to give it our all to to have something and to to be able to show each other the support that we can give but learning the, that uh learning it in the method that i was learning it on like commercial shoots or like bigger things like i i don't think that would be as as easy uh it's not man uh, <laughs> so that's, that's how i came up dude <laughs> yeah yeah when i came up when i was like doing projects at De Anza, it's actually very um cliquish mm. you know there's uh, one group who really just sticks themselves and they collaborate with each other mm. and me like my my band was always like two or three or four other people at most and mm -hmm. just for one reason or another I, I always just seemed to be the one that knew the most because i was just constantly doing research you know, not I used to, I was obsessed with it at that point. You know, mm -hmm. it's like eating, sleeping, and breathing. You know, filmmaking. So I never like I was never in that kind of environment where it's like it was where I could learn and I can you know mm -hmm. learn from other people and there'd be like no backlash whatsoever, no mm -hmm. pressure. Mm -hmm. Like oh, as soon as I like I left De Anza, it was really just like crewing on like, commercials and things like that. Mm -hmm already so it was like kind of a high pressure environment so right, that's where right, you right. kind of like oh i'm supposed to be knowing what i'm doing here yeah it's, yeah yeah so i mean it's honestly it is just an excuse because looking back on if i would just admit it sure you know what i may get yelled at and i may not be hired by those people but at least you'd feel better about yourself you know uh -huh. and you would have learned right 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 but yeah it is it's definitely a different environment because man i've run into some huge egos out there crew and you said and, egos yeah 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 especially like funnily enough and never really from the director mm -hmm. or the cinematographer it's usually mm -hmm. like grips mm -hmm. grips and um gaffords mm -hmm. 80s too i kind of have a love-hate relationship with 80s mm -hmm. i'm not a big fan of 80s mm -hmm. i don't know how much you've worked i know you were an 80 oh i'm right. really not i know that's how we met i was just doing <laughs> yeah. a favor for alexandra uh -huh. it's like she knows uh -huh. i'm not a big fan of 80s because uh -huh. I don't I don't know what your experience with 80s is because 80s job is essentially just to keep everyone on time, right? Right. 
And sometimes I just feel like, you know, with a good, with a good crew, they're already hustling, trying to do everything as quick as they can. Right. But yet they're still going to get on your ass. It's like, no, for sure. You're just trying to basically validate your existence here on set. Is that what's going right. on? Right, right, right. Like, they, you know, be like, Mike, move your ass. Come on, hustle. It's like, I'm already hustling. You see, I'm right, trying my hardest. Right, what right. are you? No, There's yeah. no need to call someone out in, in front of everyone like that. You already. No, yeah. So that's why I kind of like have like, like a love hate thing because I feel like, especially if it's a small project, like I've been mm-hmm. on some small projects where, yeah, it's a, you know, it's, it would be a branding video and then budget would be five figures but there's only a crew of like six or seven of us right you get a crew of six or seven and they're really good people Mm -hmm. you don't need to stay on top of them they're already Mm -hmm. on top of themselves and they're doing everything as fast as they can Mm -hmm. and i kind of went off on a rant here on ad's but no that's good i don't know i mean how much experience have you had with ad's as me as an ad i have not or just working with ad's working with ad's i mean i haven't really worked on too many projects where it seemed like the AD was too too strict. I mean, there were some that the ADs were just, like, getting the things moving and grooving, but I, I never, like, clashed with anything or noticed any type of clash um, in the process. Oh, I mean, I remember I was asked to be an AD on a independent project, and at first I was a PA, but then the AD didn't show up, so they are like, hey, do you think you can just, like, AD us and just like make sure we're on top of it and for me i didn't know anybody i got referred from a friend and so i was just like as a mutual acquaintance and so on this set uh i just like took a step back to myself and i'm like all right i have the shoot schedule i have the shot list i just have to be like the best that i can in order to get them moving and trying to get the whole schedule so i had to first plan out all right well how much time do we have what do we have to get through and then on top of that my main first thing is like i need to um introduce myself to everybody on the department i need to um get to know who they are and what their name is and what what their job is and task at hand that way i can fully understand what it is i'm asking of them in order to to get the production going and so with that out of the way, then it, it built more confidence and I was more comfortable with being able to like give a sense of direction to these people because if you're just like trying to go from the outside in, it's just like a whole, like you're going to cause friction just because you haven't shown, like when it comes to anybody in any environment, once you say hello, you feel that te- that like barrier broken and it's just like more fluid of a conversation or, or a communication that you have with somebody so i think that experience showed me that it's like once once you've you have that fluid communication with with the people with the crew i think your way of like trying to like reason with them and and uh, compromise with them is more understood rather than like being too like up the ass and and trying to like get them moving too fast but again it all just comes down to the situation like if if they're being more curious and curious about a certain scene and just want to keep going and going that's where it's like all right this definitely needs to move and you have to put your foot down and like be disciplined and be like all right well i I already gave you so and so chances that's it we have to keep moving type of thing and then they on their part have to compromise and accept what they need to um, sacrifice and move on towards. So, you seem to have a very good approach to things. Where did all this come from? You have a very, I don't know, just kind of like a mature and wise approach to things. Mm. Where do you think this came? Because you know, you're not that old. I am not old. Yeah, how old are you? <laughs> I'm 26. Yeah, I'm so yeah, that's interesting. You seem to have a very wise way to approach things. I mean, a big part of me, like I grew up as a middle child, so where that comes in is just like. Uh, I spent a lot of time on my own or like a lot of time asking myself questions and trying to like understand the world around me. So I spent a lot, a lot of time like just like questioning life, questioning things, questioning people's interactions. Why do people do certain things? And and I think that just made me more sympathetic and empathetic to just like the situations and, and I learned from experiences. So uh, first I like question it and then I come with an assumption and then i then 
experience it in life and then with your experiences in life you should try your best to reflect back and try to like think if your actions were were the best that you can do or if they could have redirected certain things or emotions and and i think you being able to adjust those things at as soon as you face them will only you will only be able to carry them in your future that way you don't have to then deal with it later on and you can then worry about the next things that you don't know mm. or the next things you're trying to deal with and yeah i think that pretty much served you pretty well because you're pretty busy as a freelancer right you're at the moment i am yeah, yeah. right and you, you're doing mostly freelancing as what an editor yes yeah, so uh, or all you're all over the place yeah so it, it just depends um where where it comes from i guess uh i've been mainly uh freelancing as an assistant editor on documentaries and feature documentaries which has been um, one main source of income that I've been, like, receiving. And then I've been either um, gripping on the side. So I would grip for friends and now for, like, certain things. And I recently did my first gaffing commercial gig, which was really awesome. And before that, I did, like, maybe, like, two, three gaffing jobs on, like, uh, independent projects. And so I have, like, gaffing as a skill set, uh, gripping because of, like, that, that those departments. And then I would uh, assist and edit mainly on, like, documentary productions. And then when documentary shoots come up, then I would either be asked to be a, a sound person on it to get the sound while the DP captures the video. Or uh, I can also manage the camera and then I'll be, like, the the cam op and then be a dp on so you, are you pretty much just open to anything at this point at the moment i am but it's yeah like i've been able to accept at least like I, at least i know where i'm at in my skill set to not accept more than what i can like what i can do but but i've honestly been like accepting anything honestly so like any PA jobs that came my way two years ago, I was like saying yes to all of them, and they would have me drive move trucks here and there through San Francisco, and those times were pretty fun because it's like I never thought I would be driving a big move truck, and now I have to do it because I mean it's for the production, and and I need to get paid, so I'm just gonna say yes to. Are you to still whatever. doing PA work these days? Uh, I haven't been asked for any PA. I mean, for some documentary shoots, I have, but it's like. PA slash grip, like very small interview stuff and just setting know, up for it's that. It's kind of, it's, it's a weird thing, right? Because you know, in the film industry, you're always worried about being labeled as a certain thing, one, as a certain mm -hmm. thing right? Mm -hmm. So you know, a lot of people, like, especially cinematographers, and you don't want to do too many gaff jobs because you start getting that gaffer stamp on your forehead and yeah, that's that all you ever... Does that worry you at all, you know, doing all these different things? No, because then it's like, for me, it's like... I have all these avenues to certain places, so to different departments. And so I think for me, um, I may not be getting like consistent income on a specific department, but I'll get income from one department for one gig. And then I don't hear back from that department for a while. So then what makes up the time of waiting for that specific department is like another department gets comes to me from a different network of people and so like it's like a web that that comes out and then it like so it's a pure me. sounds like it's a pure practicality thing for you it seems yeah it pretty it's doable i mean i've been mm -hmm. able to manage uh, i haven't been struggling with it so you have no worries whatsoever of like getting labeled as a grip or getting labeled as mm -hmm. an assistant editor no i mean it's not like that's gonna like hold me you know, like I'm not going to be like handcuffed to that department just because I'm just getting called for that specific You'd be department. you surprised though, man. Like I mean, like, that, that comes to me if I'm yeah. going to say yes to these good paying mm -hmm. jobs, right? But then I have to come to my understanding whether, hey, do I want to take on this amount of time on this specific direction or should I just reject it and just like keep doing what I'm doing, like touching on all bases? Yeah, because, you know, that's something like, Dave, who worked with us on the intro for the second episode of huh. this and traveled this, right? That's 
that's very much the problem he struggles with, mm-hmm. right? Because he's gapped for so many years at this point, and he's gaffed everything. There's all the war, Golden State Warriors stuff, mm-hmm. the stuff for Apple, and it's like people just have a hard time looking at him as a DP, even right. though when he gaffs for these places, right. he's essentially doing everything. He's setting up the camera angles, right. and uh-huh. he's doing all the lighting, but uh-huh. he can't get out of that gaffer right. hat, right? So that's so you'd be surprised, but you're not worried about that at all. No. I think I think if I was in his position... Which I mean, it's it's hard because he has a family, and he has to make like payments and stuff like that. So it's like, if he can't, you know, say no to these jobs and and don't, doesn't have time, then it's gonna be difficult, right? But I mean, if he really wants to be DP, I mean, it's not an easy decision. It's easier said than done. But like, just having that that firm foot, I would. That's my guess as to what would be the way to go about it just like saying like hey like i'm honestly taking this like sharp turn into DPing, and then it just comes down to him like now using all the free time that he's not using in jobs to like put work out there to show people that he can dp and then it's like a snowball effect you gotta you know be consistent and create content in order for you to go into it and his lighting background is gonna only help his 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 content well it's funny enough because that is what he did do hmm. right he put some money down on an re kit to hmm. uh, he got i think he got an alexa and then hmm. covid hit mm, yeah and that, that just put a stop to everything yeah. yeah and he luckily he was able to return the, the alexa kit and all that and then he hmm. just at that hmm. point he just needed to get you know income right 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 so that's the, but that's interesting that you're not worried about that at all because when i was coming up mm-hmm. that's definitely something that was in the back of my mind at mm-hmm. all times mm-hmm. you know especially as i started crewing more like i said i started getting more crewing jobs as an ac mm-hmm. and yeah that was definitely a concern for me it's like huh like how far down this ac road do you want to go because you do get to a certain point Oh, we're really going deep on the filmmaking <laughs> career here really? thing here yeah yeah really but you do get to a certain point where if you want to like start getting higher paying AC jobs and more consistently, you do have to start like specializing in that. No, yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, that to me that was always a concern, and I always saw myself as you know what? No, I'm a, I'm a director. Of course, you know, as the years went by and I started doing my own client work, like the labels just kind of just started disappearing, and mm-hmm. everything just kind of I like I told you, everything just kind of blended together blended. for me out of necessity, mm-hmm. right? I mean, to my own detriment, it was kind of a double-edged sword. Mm-hmm. I would say, but yeah, that was always my concern that I was just going to be viewed as an AC, right? And but I mean, else. the way the way everything blends for you, I think you you're able to create good content yourself, and because of this like different uh, scope of uh, skill sets that you have, so then it's like you can be yourself, your own production company, and then not have to worry about being on a specific skill set yeah type of thing, like know? i said it's definitely it's it's a double-edged sword mm-hmm. i'm happy like i said i can say with confidence mm-hmm. that i can do the trifecta of directing editing and dping mm-hmm. right but at the same time it's because i took on all those roles as i started doing i, know, I mean i know i told you the story before but when i started out doing my own client work i started out like getting like big crews because mm-hmm. to me it that was the that was the ideal approach, right? You surround yourself with people that are better than you than at their own specialties. That way, it mm-hmm. lifts up the whole quality of the project. Right, right, right. But as I started doing more client work, you know, it's not as if I was able to get you know big clients mm-hmm. at the beginning. So I was just trying to fatten my bottom line more than anything. Right. So I started taking away, you know, yeah. the screw rules and just took it on myself. Mm-hmm. And in the long run, yes, my skill set was able to grow, but my network didn't grow because of it right because i wasn't getting all these people on each and every job and to me this is something you and i have talked about before where Mm -hmm. to me that's the biggest differentiating factor as far as i can see again what the hell do i know you know i'm not a fucking oscar award winner Mm. you know filmmaker i'm not directing commercials from nike but just from what i've seen you know in my eight years at it the quality of work is probably the least significant factor at this point in terms of you getting gigs getting clients at least at you know at this level i would say like five figure budgets and below mm-hmm. 
it's really uh, who you know. That's what's going to make the biggest difference. I, obviously, mm-hmm. I think as you get more successful, especially in the movies, your quality of work really mm-hmm. matters at that mm-hmm. point. Right. People are not going to spend millions and millions of dollars on your movies um, yeah. if, you're, mm-hmm. if you don't have the goods. Mm-hmm. But I would say, yeah, around there, like, you know, client work, five figures and below, who you know matters way more than what you can actually do. Right, and I think big, a big thing, too, which is hard for filmmakers or artists and creative people is like putting yourself out there and like going to these people who need the content and convincing them that you would be the person to like help them with that and then convince them that you know you guys should build some type of like deal or whatever to to get them content for their own business is that something that. Then, that you're still kind of struggling with that aspect or you feel yeah pure like really comfy with that at this point i mean i'm not comfy with it just because i haven't really like um put myself into like in front of like companies or anything in front of them just because i feel like my gear i don't have that much gear really to like to do like my own type of like production for for them and if i do it's it'll be for like nonprofits and stuff like that which i've been doing but i've just been like still like working on just like polishing my skills and just like accepting work from like these departments these different like working for other departments rather than me being the one going out there if i were to be my own production company like full I would then start, like, get the ball rolling in that direction and start reaching out. And then hopefully I land with somebody, but then, like, that one company or whatever ends up referring me to somebody or what, or that content ends up reaching to somebody else. And that comes... So, again, it's, like, the whole snowball effect. But, like, you kind of... Well, my strategy would be, like, trying to reach out to multiple uh, avenues of, like, being known to, like, then work for somebody else. That way I don't just rely on, like, one company to refer me to the next people. It's like I need to then put myself out there again and try to find somebody else, and then hopefully, like, all these avenues that you create will just, like, lead to you. What is, what is I mean... Are you even interested in doing client work? Or what's the ultimate goal for you? I'm assuming the ultimate goal for you is to be directing films. Yeah, hopefully I can, right? I, hopefully I can direct films. Right now it's like I'm just working in my, like, in, again, like departments that get asked for me to, like, work for them. And and then with the free time and then the money I raise, I'll, I'll go into, like, using it to make my own personal projects. So, like... Uh, I did a dance film like not too long ago, and then it's, I, is that the aerialist or is it, oh no, you're talking no, about in my attic. In my attic, yeah. Ah. So I recently did that one, and I submitted that one to several festivals. So hopefully, like that dance film and then this music video, just like brings attention to artists out there, and if they want work, then I'd be happy to work with them, type of thing. So like. It's just like those are like darts I'm just shooting, and on the meantime, while those are like flying in the air, I'm just like working on these like assistant editing jobs or grip jobs or, or you know, continue working my muscle, all my skills, and work on independent projects for free, like all that stuff. Like just trying to be as active as I can. When you're doing these personal projects of yours, mm-hmm. is there? like a specific path or strategy that you have in mind or are you just doing you know what I really want to do this kind of project yeah and I'm just gonna do it that's exactly what it is this option two <laughs> yeah uh, I mean most of these projects that I've been doing have just been like my curiosity as to how how well will I achieve this um, project so like I can go back to um let's say let's say let's go back briefly i'm gonna give you like a a timeline of like how i approached my projects in community college i was graduating um my community college um, course and i was going into sf state and before going to sf state i was like dang okay i'm gonna be going into a university where people are like fully concentrated on this profession and this is what they really want to do I need to create something 
and I don't know what to create. I've never created anything longer than five minutes. So it's like, what am I going to do? And I'm over here thinking of like, what can I, what story do I have in mind? I want to, I want to do a black and white genre. I want to do a, a Western genre. I just like the film, uh, the film medium itself that any genre kind of like pulls me towards and gets me curious, like how would I do it? And so my first project, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to put them all together in one. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the moment I was like learning how to solve a Rubik's cube. And so I was like, Hey, what if like each face that gets solved teleports the protagonist to that movie genre and then they have to make their way through solving the cube. And so that was my way of like just incorporating like three different movie genres into one project. And that was something like I've never done and I was just like winging it and it turned out pretty Yeah, okay. that's a great concept. It turned yeah, out pretty cool great. Concept. I hope to go back and redo it and like put more effort into it, but I mean, it was something to show at SF State, and so... And you blew everyone's minds away. I mean, I, you got I, a bunch was, of groupies, like, oh my no, god, that get, was so good, I, I Orlando. I didn't get groupies, but like, when I presented it to my class, I'm like, dang, I hope this is even good enough, and then I showed it to one of my introduction courses, and everyone's like, dude, what are you doing here? Like, that's already pretty good, and I'm just like, okay, well, it just made me feel good that I'm like, I'm like where I'm supposed to be, I guess, in my skill set. And so from then I was like, great, I never done that and I did really good in it. So that's a good sign. And then after graduating SF State, I made a animation for a thesis and finishing that project, I submitted it to... You're talking about Amanda uh, Charts? Charts. Yeah. I just watched that on your uh -huh. Studio 26 interview first guest ever that where you guys can check it out on youtube i'll put a link down in the description but yeah i just watched that that was mm -hmm. really that was really good man i like the way you use the animations there it's a creative Thank way you. to do it without getting too complex with the animations right because that's what you can get lost in and doing something like that mm -hmm. it's trying to make these animations super complex and realistic but no you just took still figures and then you used you know, you did very like creative use of position and scale to create the movement and yeah i right. thought it was really well done mm -hmm. no yeah i really i really enjoyed making that one because i never thought that i'd jump into animation um luckily my professor martha kortsetsky i can't really say her last obviously you know she was really vital in his growth to get <laughs> but she was very important to like to like you know bring in bring out that spark in me to like explore what what animation's like and as much as i wanted to take like a film core class like directing actors i knew that was going to be booked by everybody everybody wants to take that so i was just like oh let me just like dive into animation and then coming out of animation course i got that skill set i can direct actors on my other personal projects yeah and I'll learn exactly. that on my own but animation skill set. You got a portfolio project out of it that yeah. won awards. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I submitted it to like several film festivals and like it won like a few awards. And I'm just like, wow, that's a really good sign. Like my first like solid animation and, and it's doing so well. So then that like got me thinking like, great, like I can do a good animation film. And then the next project after that, I was like, I got to work on something. I just graduated from my university it's been a year and i didn't really do like a solid thesis like all my classmates oh you did it no i just did that animation and like a documentary thesis i guess but it didn't feel like i was putting in the effort that all these other students were putting on their thesis class and so i was like oh well i got a group of friends i'll make a random project for us to like learn uh while working on it and and yeah, and so I made a horror film, and is that I am full? And that is I am full. I'm starting to sound like a stalker. I know every guy, every he project that this guy. Right? Me. He doesn't <laughs> need this interview, guys. <laughs> so yeah, I do my research, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so like with I am full, it's like I've never done a horror film, but from like all the horror films that I've seen, not that I'm like a film buff, because. I haven't seen all the horror films out there. And in the process of doing research for it... I think being it, a film buff is overrated anyway, especially as a filmmaker. Yeah, it can help you. It could also it distract can. you and, and make you feel like you have to put yourself in a box. Yeah, which, which it, can, it can help, but I also feel like a lot of people feel like... I, this is just my experience, mm -hmm. you know, like at Vianza. Mm -hmm. 
people feel like just because they're film buffs, it makes them good filmmakers. Like, right, you know, right, the proof right. is in the pudding. You actually exactly. have to make it. The proof is in the pudding. Yeah, yeah. So, so like to me, like film buffs, it's an overrated right. thing. Me, but I, it can't help if you, as long as your priority is still in that, the actual making right, exactly. of the film. Right, exactly. Trying films. to learn your, yeah, own, yeah. your own voice, your own language of yeah. like how you speak through the medium. So I Am Full, that's the one that took you to Brazil. Yeah, so that one, um, I wanted to make like a a satiristic film that is like a humorous concept but but the style of shooting it was very serious and and suspenseful and so that project uh ended up getting selected to just a a handful of festivals but it did get selected to one in rio de janeiro in brazil and after i got selected to that i was like I'm packing my bags. That's my excuse. Yeah, that's to that's a no take brainer. Take a vacation, you have and to then go. my film is there, so it's like, why not? Are the girls as hot as I think they are in Brazil? There is beautiful women in Brazil, and I know they they speak Portuguese. You speak Spanish and English. So what was the communication like down there? So when I went down there, I was like, okay, I know Spanish. This is gonna be not that bad. When I got there, like. And I speak Spanish. Nobody can understand Spanish. Yes, yeah, Portuguese, right? And so even Portuguese. Though, but Portuguese, if you like, if you're a Spanish speaker, you hear the Spanish in it, and so you just assume that. To me, I, I consider it kind of like broken Spanish. Not not that it, oh, not that it's in a oh, not that it's in a bad fired way. Shots at the Portuguese. Not that it's in a bad way. <laughs> by that I mean like. <laughs> By broken, I mean like you'll have a, a small portion of Spanish that you can understand, and then you'll get hit with certain Portuguese words that you don't understand, and then you'll get hit with more Spanish. So then you're just like trying to fill in the gaps. Type of thing. That's what I mean. There's no, there's no hate. There's no. I wish I could learn Portuguese. It's amazing. So, but I was surprised that English was a more understood language. Ah. And so when I was there, I would like then ask, like, Vos fala inglés? And then they would be like, oh, yeah, a little bit. And so I was like, oh, okay, that's surprising. And then I would ask, like, why is that the case? And they're like, it's just more profitable. People there can make more money being able to communicate with English speakers. How long were you there? I was there for 13 days. About like That's a good amount weeks. of time, man. Yeah. You were there on your own too, right? Yeah, and I went by myself. So uh, I was like, yeah. I got my up? film to company me, so I'm good. Yeah. You hook up with any Brazilian girls right <laughs> no, now? No, no, no. No, no, you were there strictly on business. Nah. It's so professional, this guy. Just, just, just business. But if, I, if I'm not mistaken, I did see on Instagram, mm-hmm. like you were going around with like two or three girls, right, that you ended up going to collaborate with or something? So one woman was the director of the film festival and ah and you were hanging out with her she was great she was like so happy to see me there because you know i kind of like showed up without really letting her know even though i was asking about when the uh where it's going to take place and how long it's going to be and so when i showed up she was very excited to see me and i knew that she would probably be my connection to communicate because she was a spanish english speaker so i was like my best bet is that once I'm in Brazil and I make it my way to the festival, I'll connect with her. And then from there, it'll branch out. Like, I'll probably meet So you had that strategy it. in mind going there. Right, yeah. Like, hopefully, hopefully, like, uh, she will help me be able to um, to communicate with, with people and stuff like that. And so when she saw me, she was so excited. And she, like, took me under her wing type of thing. Yeah, and, like, she turned out to around. be a looker, too. Hey, even better, right? There what you do you mean, looker? <laughs> Look at me, she's good looking. Wasn't yeah, she? Yeah. She was, right? Yeah, she's pretty. Yeah, so all uh-huh. the better, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, again, like... Come on, you can be honest, dude. Well, I mean, she was pretty, <laughs> but, like, the, the the main thing was, like, being able to, like, have that, uh, that uh, mutual connection to be able to be like, oh, great, we're both here for the festival. My project's here. She's, You're such a good she's guy. She's a film yeah. enthu- enthusiast, and... <laughs> And it was just so excited to be able to talk about film with somebody else from across the world. And mm. then not only that, the experience there and being able to show my films, like being able to see uh, young people or like anybody in general that's watching the movie uh, react to it the same way we would. So in the moments where it's suspenseful, they'd be in suspense. The moment where they'd be... Um, 
laughing they'd be laughing too and then that would make me feel good because then it just means that what i'm speaking or showing it's universal and you can interpret it hopefully from any any part of the country because i'm more of like a visual person with my projects oh that's and, what it's supposed to be it is a visual medium and right? so the big part but is people like forget it, about that the, that is true you know. but yeah i mean I, I was able to to communicate it well and then i would like go up to them and like kind of like get them to like uh tell me a little bit like hey did you like that project with the with the hamburger and they're like oh yeah that one was very like funny and like and very intense suspenseful and then i was like oh cool like i'm the director and they're like oh no way and then they're really excited so that was a really cool feeling to be able to like get like a one-on-one talk and not only that like getting to talk to the other filmmakers there from brazil and everything like everyone was so nice like everyone i met even the uber drivers all of the uber drivers i befriended them and we became like we were like socializing throughout the whole uber right even though like i was using like a translator app and like trying to like communicate with them like they'd tell me what their interests are and i'll tell them oh cool you're a photographer no way and then they would show me photos while we're like driving through the streets of brazil yeah, sounds very safe <laughs> yeah the driving there is like intense that i was like panicking in the beginning but then i was like they live here they're locals i just gotta let it go <laughs> and i stress too much if we crash we crash but but i just gotta trust that whatever they're doing and in, in, uh, behind the wheel is is safe you know because they're obviously doing this job so so you were in rio de janeiro right rio de janeiro did yeah. you, is rio de janeiro where they have that giant jesus um yeah stat? did you go and see that uh the christ the redeemer is where it is located in rio and i've was hoping to make plans to to go up there and see it but i was just getting occupied with either spending time with people or like um uh, or with the festival or just doing other things in the meantime um as much as i wanted to do like all the touristy things uh the main thing was like i was able to socialize with people and connect with people and have memories with people and i think that stuff cannot be replaced And so I can go back and visit Crest Redeemer on my next Rio trip. Like, that's no big mm. deal. And you're telling me it never occurred to you to try to hook up with a local over there? I was, you know, I was just there probably, like, if things happen, things will happen. But, like, I wasn't really, like, eager to, like, search my way into someone's pants. You there know? you go. Look, Listen to that, ladies. It's the kind of guy you could take <laughs> home to mama. That's good, man. You know mm. what? Probably going there just for that. That's probably why you enjoyed it so much anyway, to be perfectly yeah. honest, you know. For what exactly? No, just there, you're just there to enjoy the whole experience. You're not no, worried yeah. about mm -hmm. trying to hook up with locals or anything mm -hmm. like that. You're not mm -hmm. there on the hunt. You're just there no. to experience Brazil. I'm and not trying to be a conquistador and just come and rape <laughs> oh. the women and leave. You know, that's like a conquistador <laughs> mindset, just to be straight. But No, but I understand that. I think that's mm -hmm. probably why you did get so much out of that experience. Because you were just there to there enjoy. There was a list of things I wanted to do. Like, I wanted to rock climb at the rock climbing gym, which I did. I wanted to play soccer and through a journalist from the festival he referred me to a friend and then i just had to trust even though i'm good with body language and stuff like that i just trusted him and he led me to a, a soccer field in the back of a high school like across the city from far away Damn. but were you so what was going soccer. through your mind when he was leading you like that in my head i'm like Are you like is this guy gonna this kidnap me yeah, you know But he seemed like a cool dude and his friend's a cool dude. So let, let's just go with this option and just like when things get sketchy, then I'll worry. But nothing seems sketchy at all. Because it is supposed to supposedly a pretty like dangerous place, right? I think because like the favelas are there and like the relationship between like favelas and like the, the rich area, which is like the Rio de Janeiro side, the beach side and all that, where all like the more wealthy people are. They're pretty like... To me, the biggest thing is, like, if if people have, like, stereotypes of one another, then their first interaction with one another can read from body language and stuff like that. So I feel like when judgment's there, tension will rise. But, like, for me, I was not worried at all. I actually wanted to go into the favelas. Yeah. That... I asked people, like, hey, can we go up to the favelas? Because I know they have a soccer field up there. This is when I was trying to search for a place to play soccer. And then somebody would tell me, like, oh, no, like, don't go to the favelas. And, you know, really? That's, that's a shame. It's a shame, yeah. And, and it seems like there is segregation there because, you know, like, when it comes to, like, classism and stuff like that in different countries, like, it just, it just bad. So there, there, there is that, that 
that you'll see. And so you didn't get a chance to go into the flavors. I didn't, then, but yeah. hopefully next time I can. Yeah, because that's something I would be curious mm-hmm. too. You, know, you just mm-hmm. that's all you really see. You see so many pictures, just like a mountain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of them, I yeah, I would be right. very curious just to walk through those streets. No, and most definitely. And I'm from Mexico. Oh, I'm not from Mexico, but my family's from Mexico, and I visited Mexico where my parents are from for years and you know like we aren't from like a city they're from like a pueblo and pueblos is more like run down and very low income and like to me i just i i kind of like can relate or understand the communities that that live in like rural places so i can only like want to deep down like know the people and it's like that's i think that's the thing like anybody would want is like for somebody to be interested in them and getting to know them and who they are and what their lifestyle is like yeah and it's just it's fascinating when you think about what life must be like for them right what Mm -hmm. a day-to-day life right would be i kind of like fantasize about almost living with some like a family for uh, like two weeks or something like that that lives in that kind of situation just to really see what it's like like when uh when you know sam and i do these talk tours we went out to have you ever heard of greenfield here in no, california I have not. exactly like i've never heard of it mm-hmm. super small town uh i mean their main street it was just so empty and you know when i was a kid i probably would be so bored with the idea of a town like that but now that i'm older it's really just more curiosity strikes me, right? Mm-hmm. Like, what life? What must life be like for people who live here? Mm-hmm. What do they do on a day to day basis? You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, I find it very fascinating, mm-hmm. and that's kind of why I, I, I kind of like veer towards more documentaries now. That's sort of my interest. No, that'd be a great. Way kind of why I know it's a, it's a ton of work, man. <laughs> like yeah, feature like that. Well, for sure. I can't. I mean, you've worked on a lot of documentaries. Yeah. So you, it's it's no joke. Yeah, it's ridiculous how much work it is. It's right? crazy when people are like, "Oh, can you do like a documentary to my, me and my life?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Oh, yeah." I mean, but it's just gonna, con- uh, it's just gonna, we're just gonna need a lot of time and effort, and like, that's where budget can can be very scarce. And like, I gotta be super passionate about about your life because <laughs> because it's like, dang, like. It's just so much work that it just seems very easy, but it's like just so much to like. The bigger the project, the the harder it is. That's just yeah. Well, the main that's, thing. that's funny. It's always that's always kind of the thing. Whenever you tell someone that you're a filmmaker or you're a videographer, they always say, "Oh, I have a short film I've always wanted to do. You you want to yeah. do it with me?" It's like your first time meeting with them. Yeah, I mean, it's, like that's uh, exciting to you. I'm like, yeah, sure, <laughs> for sure. But then it's like. How much work are you gonna do? Yeah. Versus yeah. how much work am I gonna do for you to get this thing alive? You know, so it's just like being able to. And it, is, it goes back to is something we talked about when we were doing the scout, right? Where in film school, you feel there's a lot of people there where it's obvious they're just in love or entertained by the idea of being a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. But once they see like the amount of work it actually yeah. takes to do them well. No, yeah like yeah they're, they're not doing the work and they yeah. lose interest and i think that's the same thing you know when people will tell you as soon as you tell them you make films or videos oh i've got this short film idea do you want to do it's like Most you, you guys have no idea what you're asking of us when you do right. that i'm sure the amount of work that goes into exactly i think with like every there's a large amount of professions out there that people have the same experience when it comes to like seeing new people come in and thinking that it'd be a cake in the park to 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 get through and to like achieve certain things it's like yeah you can but to keep going and to keep going at it and wanting to like continue this it's going to take a lot out of you and if you're not passionate then you better make your way out now because you're just going to waste your time and 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 what is, so what do you tell people when they ask you like that? Hey, you know, I've got this great idea. Or yeah, do a, have, why, don't, why don't you do a documentary I mean, on me? I'm curious to hear, you know, like to be able to talk about it. and then So you'll let them pitch? For sure, yeah. It's like, oh yeah, let, let's talk about it for sure. And then and then bring them down to earth and tell them like, all right, well, this is what it's going to take. Okay, and then so it, when you let them pitch, are you listening with an open mind or you already know? That you're gonna you're gonna eventually turn them down. You're just letting them talk well, it out first. Well, what I like to do first is like I like to listen to the story, and then I just step. I just stay in the whole like uh, the story, the writing 
side of it first and like just think about like where the story's going and how it should go and this and this and that so you're actually listening with an open mind that hey yeah I might, I might possibly be interested in like doing a good this. friend of mine reached out to me and he came to me with an idea and i was like very curious like oh, okay cool like let me hear it and then he's talking this and this and this and that and i'm like all right this is cool but you have a gap here like there needs to be a motive for this character to do what it's doing or or this and that and then i just try to think of ideas like this person could be in this situation or this and that and then they start to like be like oh yeah that would definitely help and then once the story gets like closer to where it should be then it's like all right now we have a clear idea as like a good story that can manifest from this idea and then from there then it's like all right now with what we came to to collect it's like this is what it's going to take to do it and this is the approach and that's where it's just like where the grounding down to earth comes in and it's like the amount of work that might go into it and just the time invested and to achieve the look that you want to convince the idea of the story to feel realistic is just like we're just just things have to be you know taken into consideration because i mean with my projects i try to make sure it's like what is it that i can do what is it that i do have access to and then i get the bar rolling in that direction but i don't try to like go too far-fetched if i know that it's just going to be close to impossible to really like try to get this to happen now like i can ha make the idea but then I'll just wait to actually act upon it until I have the resources to do so. So that's just it. I mean, once once it gets to the grounding point of like being realistic as yeah, to you're what we'll... you're very generous with your time. Mm. Yeah, because that's definitely I would I take the exact opposite approach because mm. especially because I'm older now too. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm forty, right? To me, time is the most precious like asset you have. You can't ever get it back. So so I. I so that's why usually when people tell me, oh, yeah, I have this, you know, this short film idea, let's do it. That's why I go for the immediate kind of shoot down, because I know once they realize the amount of work it actually takes, and I usually 99% mm -hmm. of people are never going to follow through with it anyway. Right, right, right. I'd rather just get straight to that instead of, okay, you're going to pitch me your idea, who knows, how I'm done by, we might spend 20, 30 minutes right, right, right. on that. I'd rather just kind of nip it in the bud and uh -huh. here's the reality of what it takes. And, but I would encourage them, but, you know, there's nothing to stop you from doing it yourself, honestly, right. you know? And I mean, uh, the if, SLRs are cheap. You can get a lot of reps in there. You can learn some stuff. And, I, mean, I mean, if you're connected to the project, if you're connected to the idea yourself, then that comes down to like, also doing your best not to just like shut it down and then try to think to yourself like oh this would be a really fun project to work on but, see, like, but to me like it never even gets to that point where i could be connected yeah. so i don't let them pitch it to me <laughs> i just like you know like, you're just limiting just, yourself i mean that's that's it's, if, no, it's true if you but, yourself don't want to be like working on independent projects i see but like yeah i mean who knows like just be open-minded and just see if if it will be something that you might want to do and then I mean, it doesn't take too much time to just listen. Yeah, to me, it, it depends who asks. If like you mm -hmm. ask, that's a different mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. right? But if someone mm -hmm. asks who doesn't really do it, that's when I just kind of shut it mm -hmm. down. It depends who asks. Cause it's, it's something that you learn when, uh, especially if you start doing the client work mm -hmm. and you're doing your own thing, is it's what you call qualifying your leads, right? Because when you start out doing client work, you basically take any call or any opportunity that comes your way for meetings or anything. But you come... You quickly you learn quickly enough that you can waste a lot of time, a lot of your time in meetings when you could tell right away that those people would probably never going to be your clients to begin with because they're just not willing to pay mm -hmm. what you're worth, mm -hmm. or they just have different expect expectations and everything like that. Right. So you can, and sometimes you know you're spending time on back and forth emails on top of the actual you know meeting itself. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of time that you end up investing right and in this potential like business deal where if you were just right up front from the beginning of what your price is or you know you do other things to qualify leads to really weed out those people right you could save yourself and them no, a whole lot definitely. of time right, right. so that's really definitely. kind of more the mindset that i approach because I, I like my approach has always been i've been more into doing the brand videos and the client work right whereas you really love the narrative and films and stuff like that right, so right, i can right. see I can definitely see why, from your point of view, you want to be open to hearing right. what other person's idea is. But I do, I do, mm. I do think that when it comes to that moment where you want to like 
you know, be straight up in front is once once the idea has been mentioned and then you get to the, the, the conversation of this is what it takes, are you committed and you don't see that commitment in them, then that's where you, you just like back off. Like you don't, you don't continue it any further. But if you see something in it and they're not too committed and they just want to hand it over to you, you know, that's up to you. That's, you know, they're, they're generous to offer you a thing that they've written and they believe in you to, to make it come to life. So that's something to take into consideration. You're definitely a lot nicer than I am. <laughs> that's for sure. I mean, I, I'm not, everyone who knows me, I, I, I'm not the nicest guy. I'm not an asshole, but mm -hmm. when it comes to things like that, I just tend not to, I tend to like, as I get older, I know what I like. And I don't like, and like I said, I view time as more precious. Mm -hmm. So I just don't open myself up to it. But like I said, it also right. depends who's asking. If it's a fellow right. filmmaker like you, then I'm going to listen. Because right. I know you already know the work it takes to make these things happen. So, right. But so again, like somebody who's not in the field could probably come to you with a really great idea that you can see that might be really beneficial yeah, I, to the viewers. I get it. Or, yeah, I, I get it. There's definitely, you know, you never know. But you get they they could have a great yeah, idea and exactly. they may not be able to do the work, but you can take that idea and run For with sure. it yourself, right? For sure. Um, no, I get that. I guess mm -hmm. to me, I'm not I'm not really worried about missing out on those ideas because mm -hmm. I feel like there's a million ideas out yeah. there, mm -hmm. really, and then not just from other people, even just from yourself. You just experience so many different things, yeah, you right. consume many different types of things, ideas. To me, ideas are endless. That's right. the easy part for me, honestly. Right. Ideas Until they easy. come into yeah, it's like it's making made. it's making it happen. That's right, the hard exactly. part. So like I I don't I guess I don't put as much stock into ideas or coming up with them because mm -hmm. I do that anyway. That's mm -hmm. that's not a problem. So right. and to me there's millions of good stories out there, but how mm -hmm. well can you actually tell it? That's right. what matters more. Right, exactly. So that's like I mean, but who knows, maybe this is also just me validating my approach to it or mm -hmm. I just don't want them to waste my time. Maybe I mean, that you could be might, possible. You could find one that you're just like, oh, this speaks to your life and your experiences and you feel like you have to be something therapeutic too because some projects become therapeutic to filmmakers. You know what? I'm glad you brought that up because I do want to ask more about Amended Truck since that was mm -hmm. about your cancer right. experience. Right? Mm -hmm. Did you Was that a hard project for you? to even show in class because it was so personal like i assume people didn't know you had cancer at that point um in class i don't think yeah nobody really knew that i was a cancer survivor i think only like my closest friends in the class did but i wasn't i wasn't ashamed of what i had and i wasn't um scared to talk about my experience and stuff like that I just know that, like, after my experience, I was, like, just fully committed in film and everything that I started to realize that I wasn't telling my story in my projects. And so when it came to this final project for my animation course, I was like, uh, I was like, you know what, why am I avoiding, um, why am I trying to pick all these different uh, topics or subjects for a project and not go into my own personal life and my own experience and, and get that on, onto a project and be able to express kind of like that experience of what that was like. And I did, I try, I did endless nights trying to work on it. And this was my first semester in animation. And then my professor saw it and she really liked it. And she offered me like, hey, if you want and you take my next course, you can use this project for your next final. You just have to like touch it up a bit because I think you can um, fine tune it. And then that motivated me to take another semester of animation and then I was able to fine tune it and then that's when I sent it to film festivals. And what was that like you know, when you're making that project and you're essentially re-experiencing your cancer journey? I think I, I really enjoyed it because to me the beneficial part was like, being able to spread public awareness and to be able to also like kind of like allow people to to kind of be either confronted or or kind of like reflect on their own life and their own experiences whether 
whether they are a person struggling with anything related to their health or whether they have relatives or friends or know of somebody that is going through something like that. I made sure that in my project, you don't see any specific faces. You don't hear any specific words or names. So that's why you did it that way. And that's why I did it that way. Uh, and another reason was because I was just starting lazy. off in animation. I was just lazy to make people's faces. Yeah, it's a lot more but, work. But that was really hard. But in the moment when I was like, dang, this is really hard to make the faces, I thought to myself, can it work without faces? It does. And then I saw the metaphor behind and the importance without using detail and faces that I was like, oh, this is even better not to do faces. So even though I was lazy in the, yeah, in the, how happy were you at that was actually start, better without the yeah, faces. I mean, it's obviously <laughs> a, the best feeling. But... <laughs> But it's like, even though I was lazy in the beginning to like be confronted with this tough task, um, I would have still done it if I needed to for the project. Like that, that it doesn't mean like I was just trying to cut corners and stuff like that because I questioned it first and took it into very careful consideration. Then I went in that direction because it, it felt right. No, I agree with you. I think it definitely, that's one of the strong points because it's, almost a minimalist approach mm -hmm. to animation, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it makes it stronger. What is, I mean, are you, you talk about it in amended shards, but obviously people who are listening to this and watch this, mm -hmm. they don't know your story with cancer. Would you mind like right. taking us through no, that? Yeah, so um, in 2014, I was feeling pain in my left testicle and I wasn't too sure whether it was just going to go away or not. When I was younger in seventh grade, I felt like some pain down there before, and I remember going into surgery, um, and it was in seventh grade. In seventh grade, and this was a testicular contortion where, like, you're the, playing with it too much, and it got twisted. Yeah, I, got, I was just because I was <laughs> playing it with too much, and puberty just like got <laughs> the best of me. But uh, but yeah, so like the I guess the testicles ended up like twisting at, at a young age, and so that was causing pain back then. But then, when doing research, um that usually once a young man experiences that kind of stuff at, at that age or whatever, or just that case in general, it would eventually likely lead to testicular cancer in the future. And um, once I was in community college, yeah, once I was in community college, that's when like I started to notice the irregular size, the texture, and then... Um, I started to feel a lot more pain, more frequent. And then one day when uh, I was returning from Mexico uh, at the airport, the whole plane ride, I was in pain. And I was just like, all right, this is not normal. So How bad was the pain? It was like a nine, eight. Like I couldn't sit comfortably. I don't know if you ever hit, got hit in your testicles. I've been hit in my testicles. But you know how like it reaches to your abdomen? Yeah, that yeah. Pain? So like just that pain was like very like uh uh tense in my abdomen and then uh my testicle was sensitive as well and so for me i was just like i'm going to the yard ER. like let's just let's just go about it so right from the airport after yeah once i landed uh first i stayed with my brother and we were like let's just like see if it just like goes by whatever and i was like it's not leaving and so in the middle of the night we went and then we went to the er and they did a few brief tasks and then they sent me back with some painkillers and just told me if it's still there, like come back. And I can't remember exactly that timeline, but I just remember going back and being like, it's not going away. And so in that process, I met with the, the nurse and then the nurse, I did a brief check and then he went to go um, talk to the doctor. And then in the process of him going to the doctor before that, I remember I did my own research and was like looking up the internet and me, I'm pretty critical and I just don't take all information and can and be gullible or just like be easily in influenced by the information found on the internet because everything will lead to cancer type of thing. But from the actual um, uh, side effects that I was reading, it seemed appropriate that that's what I had. And so before I went to the ER for the second time, which was that time, um, I concluded to myself that testicular cancer is probably what I had. And so I kind of like diagnosed myself already. 
And so when it came to the point where the nurse left and the doctor came in, the doctor was kind of like beating around the bush before telling me. And in my head, I'm like, ready, like, just, just say, it, you know, like, just save us the time and like, like, let's move on with what we have to do. And then he ended up telling me, like, he first started it with like, so, uh, do you know Lance Armstrong? Yeah, well, he's a very good cyclist. <laughs> what a segue. Yeah, yes. I know. <laughs> he, felt, he felt he had to transition yeah. into it. Yeah, I'm like, bro, you're a doctor. Like, <laughs> this is like doctor 101. You got to be just straight up with your homies, you know, your clients, your patients. And so, I was just like, uh-huh. And then, and so he's like telling me like my testicle was at an irregular size and that it's possible that I have, that I do have a mass, or it's possible that I have a mass, and that I, oh no, I think that's when we did the whole CT scan, or the ultrasound, and they saw that it wasn't a regular mass, and then they told me that we have to go into the whole procedure of like scheduling me for a biopsy, uh, a biopsy, and then doing chemotherapy, and then getting me uh, with a specialist and then going through that whole process and so it was kind of like uh interesting obviously when your life just you just have to go down a different path for you to like focus on your health were but, you very matter of fact about it when everything happened you were just like very objective okay this is what i have and this is what we have to do let's just do that yeah that was pretty much my attitude really like, and they never like got you emotionally i mean i mean when i was like alone yeah but like it was like, I can't, it, I would have to say it's briefly because I just don't remember too much of that happening. And so when it came to the moment of like, of me getting diagnosed and everything, I'm just like, well, I can just like, you know, like just kick and scream and, and complain about it. But what is that going to do? That's not going to cure me. So it's like, I have to trust in the specialists, the doctors and everybody that know more about this than I do. And I have to, you know, just trust that they they have my back. How about when you started losing your hair through chemo? Because, you know, when I watch interviews, or you read the stories for a lot of people, that's when it hits, right? When they start losing their hair. Yeah, to me, to me again, like I, I saw, I saw the hair as something that can easily grow back type of thing. Like, Yes, it's our identity, it's changing, and it's hard to see change, but I think going back to the whole middle child thing, like, I, I, I accepted myself for who I am type of thing, for who I am on the inside, that whatever happens to me on the outside doesn't really matter. Like, I can lose a leg, I can lose, I can be amputated if this cancer gets bad, you know? Like, to me, it's just like, if it's what I have to do to save my life, then I've just got to do whatever I have to do, and, and I just have to try my best, and I think just being able to try my best was like the best thing I can ask for because then it's like if I lose a the fight then it, it, it I, I at least tried my best and then there's yeah I can see how that helps because you don't get lost in despair right right mm -hmm. and this say your mentality definitely helps a lot with that right, right most definitely and that's not easy I mean it might seem easy and for me to be able to speak about it but again I spent a lot of time asking these questions about myself and getting to know myself that it kind of like was a good foundation for approaching something as hard as this. No, in Amended Shards, there's that really touching moment where you invited your family to come over and yeah. help shave your head. Yeah. So it almost sounds like your family probably had a harder time dealing with it than you did. Yes, I do think that my family was like struck with a surprise behind the news, obviously, and because we are really close, um, trying to just imagine that they might lose me was a big hard thing to come to terms with and so like it's understood like especially when they come around me and then the subject doesn't want to be brought up because they don't want to feel guilty making me feel bad and this and that but the way i saw it is like i just started like cracking jokes about it making fun of myself the way i was looking the way about me losing a testicle and all i have is one testicle <laughs> left but i have more balls than most people type of thing <laughs> so it's just like all these things just like lighten up the mood and it's like i i, I understand people it's gonna are gonna feel however hurt they want to feel but you're not the one going through it and i'm the one that gets, that's going through it so you should do your best not to feel so bad about the situation and 
and for me it's like i just had to like kind of like encourage them and then show that we're we're in this together and so i wanted them to be a part of it by taking one chip out of my hair in this like family gathering and everybody was very excited and it was it was kind of fun too and just being able to have like just everyone there trying to like be a part of my transformation and just being on my journey type of thing and so that was very very rewarding yeah i thought that was a great idea not just you know for the the film but just in general i thought that was an awesome idea though you do mention in amended charges that you ended up gaining 20 pounds yeah so were you depressed or you, you said you were eating your emotions away so i was uh how did it go i was on steroids and so like steroids would like enhance my trying way. to get jacked yeah like i was thinking swallow. about it do i want to get jacked or do i want to get fat so i chose fat <laughs> And uh, with the steroids and everything, like as I was consuming food, I was gaining the weight from that because I was just like very fatigued and I wasn't really, I was a little active. I would go on runs and stuff like, but a majority of the time I was very fatigued and just like sitting around. So the the weight with, I mean, the food with the steroids just like enhanced my weight. But I knew that one, it's like uh, I wanted to, eat food to like just be like a comfort food type of thing but but mainly i know that like through cancer you end up losing your taste and with losing your taste on top of that you then become like um i don't know the right word but you just don't want to eat you just so you loss of appetite yeah there's a, there's a large loss loss of appetite because if your food doesn't taste good then you yeah, just you don't, don't want to eat, eat. Yeah. so for me hot sauce became my best friend and before that, I was like not too much into hot sauce, whatever. But in this case, hot sauce was just like, I haven't left. I'm right here. Like, <laughs> you can still see me. You can still taste me. Like, I got your back. And so I was putting hot sauce on my quesadillas and just eating that. And I'm like, thank you. At least there's some type of flavor. And so that was like a, a really good um, a way of me like continuing eating too. But But again, like I just knew in the back of my head, like, uh, eating would be only beneficial to me because if my body becomes to decay in some way, at least um, hopefully the food might be good. But in my process of like my diet, like I can't say I had the healthiest diet. And usually when it comes to cancer, it's like your diet shifts into a much more healthy, cleaner, much more diet. But for some reason, I was just eating as I please what I would know that would kind of like make me uh, feel good, I guess. But I wouldn't try to overdo it. It would just be like enough to just make me feel good. Um, but you still ended up gaining 20 pounds. Yeah, and I was gaining pounds. And and again, like it, it makes me feel guilty because like I was eating stuff that you shouldn't be eating because it would only make the situation worse through your cancer experience type of thing. And to my head, in my head, I'm like not really trying to think about it. And so I would just keep eating and but like after the whole thing like after i was done with my my last surgery and the chemotherapy and everything my results were like got back to normal really quickly and i was like in pristine like all my results were like okay perfect okay everything's good and so i was just like very concerned that my eating habits even though after i was done with the whole procedures and everything with the treatment like it would like make my results then like come back down mm. and like have me restart all over. But fortunately it didn't, but I'm not trying to like be an advocate and say like, you can eat whatever you want when you're on cancer. <laughs> like, no, like, like that, that I, I don't want to be like, I don't want to say that that was, you know, the case for me. It's just, it can be worse for just other people depending on what they eat. But at the very me, least, it seemed to uplift your spirits. Yeah. Yeah. So when you gained the 20 pounds, is that where the cycling came into your life then? Well, cycling came in like a lot later. Um, I think when after the cancer uh, experience, I was just more concentrated on um, trying to go back to focusing on my profession because I felt like being in the hospital and being away from society and everything i just wanted to like get back to to what i have to do and it's just sucked having to be having it to be delayed so i remember doctors would recommend to me like 
uh, you should probably like take a break from school and everything so you can just like rest and all this. And in my head, I'm like, no, like I'm still going to go to school. I'm still going to take my college courses and I'm going to figure out a way because like and deep down, it's like uh, I didn't want the sacrifice my parents made for me to get an education to stop. And so I wasn't going to like answer, like stop me from doing that either. So in a way that that's where I ended up just like uh, trying my hardest to to just get through school and get through my profession and and continue um, going about it that way. And uh, I just recently, which is like last year during the whole pandemic and everything was when I started to like get the ball rolling after like I finished graduating my university after I started getting some work in my profession that with the pandemic it gave most of us free time to like do stuff and in my head I was like my body and my health and stuff like that is important which I was taking care of it but not as good as I am now and so I was like at least I know that I am at a good mental state and I'm good in my profession and skill set that now I can worry about my body figure that that I could have worried about later on that wasn't very vital to me um in, earlier in, in in my life or well after the whole uh cancer process and um now it's like I my friend of mine got me into uh, a marathon and so we've been training for this marathon that's been getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And so after its first delay, I was like, oh, well, I did all this training for running. What can I do? And a fundraiser came up for uh, cancer uh, pediatric patients. And so I decided to, like, take on this cycling challenge. And I bought a bike and I got my gear all set up and I just started tackling the miles on the bike and i just tried my best to to achieve a goal and i went from trying to go for 200 miles to then reaching 300 miles to then like trying to get close to doubling it and going up to 500 miles in that month and i think that that was like just like all that effort and time i ended up like getting my my way into being a more active person so you didn't even have a bike before that challenge no it never even entered your mind to get into cycling yeah no most definitely i mean long time ago i've been wanting to do a triathlon but i just knew that it was just like something to put in my bucket list to do in the future but i never act upon it other than like in high school is when i got into swimming and so like that's when i was like oh i can do this i already know how to run I could probably get on a bike easy and just continue that training. So then later on, which is now, is when I was, like, putting it into fruition. Why a triathlon? Because it can only get easier. <laughs> is that really why? <laughs> no, I mean, like, I, I, a Marvel hero of mine is Iron Man, but that's not the exact reason why I want to do triathlon. <laughs> it's because it's called the Iron Man competition. But because there is an Iron Man competition, which is a triathlon, which is one of the hardest triathlons out there. I Again, it's like, I just like to put these like far-fetched uh, challenges or on my bucket list and be like, oh, I want to do that. And I just like put it to the side and it's, who knows if I'm ever going to do it. But then, But then I like, make the decision i'm like you know what i'm gonna like focus my spare attention on this and let's see how far i can at least get and so the iron man is something that's on my on my radar too yes but now that you're doing the biking and you're taking yeah. care of that portion of it right so let me this is something i've always been curious about with the biking why when you're just training why wear like the biking uniform so with the biking uniform it helps you uh, be one more aerodynamic so like you can cut through um, the wind easier and you don't have like your your loose clothes dragging you back and so you start to notice that the longer distances you go that with anything that's holding you back more it keeps you from going further in your distance and so that's why you start to see more lighter bikes you start to see more lighter gear 
and then people like being able to work on their their way of like cycling through certain parts of like the turns and the wind and all that stuff but it's only to get you further and faster and so and also i like the 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 jersey because it has like pockets on the back and then that's where you can keep like snacks where you can keep your uh your, your phone and stuff and like with pants when you're moving your legs it's hard to like reach in and pull out yeah, and, yeah, and that, that kind sense. of stuff and so like with the suit you just have like a, a nice shorts with like paddings like to keep you comfortable through long distances and then with that pocket in the back it helps you and the the jersey also has holes in between so it helps you ventilate better too so once you're riding you're cooling down better with that type of like gear yeah you're probably the first person i've seen on a bike with a bike outfit on oh nice who's actually in shape oh nice <laughs> you, you see a lot of them you know around here that they're yeah. all fat as fuck uh-huh. <laughs> it's like well, hopefully it seems to be a requirement for cyclists over years i mean hopefully they're working their way up to yeah here, yeah but you're probably the first person i've seen that's actually in shape and where's yeah. that thing thank you i appreciate it yeah. i hope i can get in better shape but yeah what's the goal I was like, you have a goal to have a six pack. What is it? I mean, the goal is just to be uh, capable of doing the task of a triathlon. So it doesn't matter what body shape I have. It's just if I can do that, then it just means that I'm in I'm in good shape. So, you don't care how your body looks at all. Not really. No, really? No. Yeah. Interesting. I can go back to being fat if I if I if I do, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter because I want to be healthy and and in shape to be capable of like being active and stuff like that, but. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. It doesn't affect your self esteem at all. No, not at all. No, that means you really yeah. are about who you are on the inside. Mm, then. Most definitely. Ah, interesting. When you're riding that bike, mm-hmm. are you listening to music? Uh, yeah. So I, I recently started listening to music because I got like a speaker on my bike. So then, like, I just connect my phone and then I just go off and listen to, to music as I go. Or well, you're not allowed to listen to it on earbuds? Or? You can, but I, to me, I just feel like it's more dangerous when it comes to like hearing cars behind you and, and, and that kind of stuff. When you go on your bike rides, so you go on some pretty long ones, right? Like how, yeah. how long do you usually go for? Um, the longest I've been on my bike is probably like 25 miles, I think. And mm-hmm. then one day I wanted to hit like 30. So then I have a stationary bike at home and then I just continued it right when I got home. How long does 25 miles take? 25 can take me about like an hour and 30 minutes maybe to an hour and 40 an hour and 30 an hour and 40 and you used to not listen to music right i mean it wasn't that long when i wasn't listening to music but but it's not bad i mean it's it's good like with running too like with running i usually didn't listen to music until recently i bought like some beats headphones but like a majority of the time, pretty much my whole running career, I wasn't listening to music because I just like to be able to help myself be my own motivation to keep me going. And it's a, just like a good mental exercise to just like be your support system and tell yourself to keep going when you just don't want to keep going. And and yeah. So why the change with cycling then? With music? Yeah. I mean, it's just funner. I mean, like, even though with without music i can i can still do it and still i still have that mindset ingrained in me that it's now it's now nice to have both mindsets as i work out in my current workouts so it's rather than just like passively doing it and just like writing as i like feel like it like it's nice to have like that disciplinary mindset in me to like push myself and tell myself that you know you're 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 not done yet. You know, I try to create myself a certain destination to get and come back. So it's like, if I'm not done, I'm not done until I'm done. And then that's when I can like fully rest. Like with runs, I'll keep running. I won't stop. And I will stop until I stop my whatever distance that I have to do. Uh, when it comes to the street, if there's traffic lights, that's my only exception for my safety. But if there's no traffic lights, I'm just going and going and going and going. until I finish whatever my goal is. Yeah, I remember as a kid growing up here in school, you know, they would make you run the mile and they'd time you. Mm-hmm, right. And it was always such a feat to finally be able to run the mile without stopping. Right, yeah. Right, you get that pain in your, you know, yeah, your ribs. Yeah, everything. But it's funny, it's like, and as an adult, I don't know, for some reason, I just went away. Mm-hmm. Like, you do kind of set it in your mind, okay, I'm going to run this long. And then, yeah, I'm not done until I run that long. Mm-hmm. And that's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. But there is that 
there are people out there who feel if you listen to music while you're running or doing any sort of aerobic exercise, it is mm. cheating. Because mm. definitely, you know, that certain song comes up, you get that pump of adrenaline all mm. of a sudden mm-hmm. and it makes mm-hmm. it easier. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're taking the caveman approach, as my friend Jeff likes to say, it's like you said, you're just, <laughs> it's just you and the activity right. and your thoughts and that's it. Right. And that's what's pushing you. No, I think, I think, you know, like music can help you for sure. Like if that's your way of running, some people just don't like running because it's just it's either boring or or, or that kind of or very uncomfortable trying to like get through running. But uh, for running without or with music, I mean, I just I just I just feel like without music, it just it just helps me a lot better to just like fully concentrate. Really mm-hmm. interesting. What do you like about cycling the most? Cycling the most, yeah. going down the hills. <laughs> yeah, you just like just ride it. <laughs> you just try hard to like get your way out, which is a bitch, you know. But once you you start to get past the hill, like there's both parts. Like the the hard, uh, the, actually the best part is like trying to get up a hill that you've never done or trying to get up it at a certain pace or whatever because that's where you know you're you're being put to the challenge and being able to see your limits and then the reward is you coming down from that hill and like going down so but both are like just as equally as important but you can't get to go down the hill without going up so you got to be grateful for that you're really all about putting in the work hmm? So what do you enjoy the least about cycling, then? The least about cycling? I think I don't like, and that's not about really cycling. It's just about the the cars that are on the roads that are inconsiderate about cyclists. So then it just puts your life in danger when it's not really your fault for that. What would they do, for instance? Well, it's like if they just drive too close to you. And so they don't, they don't put in the effort to like avoid you and and drive slower near you. So like a lot of cyclists end up like getting hurt or pass away from from reckless driving. How much did your bike cost? It was a, it was a good amount. You bought it used and got a great deal. Yeah, I bought it. I bought it used for like about eight hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, but you it used for brand like new, probably like fifteen hundred, two thousand. Fifteen hundred to three thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So you didn't have a bike at that point. Was there any mm. hesitation on your part at all to get to put down eight hundred bucks on a mm. bike? No, no. I was just like, I want to get into cycling. I need a road bike. Most road bikes are like. Eight hundred, seven hundred dollars minimum, and so it's like when I came across this one, I'm like carbon fiber. Like this is a really good brand. It's like a small bike. I can't. It's just like uh, those things, those lucky things you find on online. And the benefit was that this guy was too big for the bike, so when he bought it from the woman, he never rode it. He just left it in his garage, thinking that he would probably use it maybe or sell it. But he probably got approached by it and was like, oh, this is a good deal. I can't, I have to like get a hold of this. And then he just held on to it and then was like, all right, I'm just holding on to it. So then he tried to get rid of it. And so that's where I came in and I just took it from him. It worked out perfectly for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As soon as you brought it home, you just started riding it immediately. Yeah, as soon as I brought it home, I really wanted to get into uh, changing the pedals because the pedals were mountain bike pedals. And then I never rode with cycling pedals and cycling cleats so then i was like well i know i'm eventually gonna go that route so i'm just gonna buy the stuff i traded the the pedals and i put my shoes on and i went out and just started learning oh you went deep right away yeah how did i feel that first time you clicked your shoe it was scary because at first it's like you don't really know how to do it and then once you're in you're just kind of like stuck and the main thing i tried to practice was like learning how to unbuckle before I even go off riding. So like getting on my bike, buckling in, buckling off, buckling in, buckling off, and then going out. But then I would come to some moments where I would end up like getting stuck and not really knowing how to buckle. And then at the stoplight, I'm just like, oh, there I go. And then I hit the ground. <laughs> or like when one time I was riding with my brother and we were just picking up the pace from from stopping. 
and I accidentally like uh, uh, touched his tire with my tire, and then I like flipped over to the side, and I just like hit myself on the side. So you guys were pretty close then. Uh, in that moment, we were because I was like distracted. Those cows on the side of the road, and I just like looked over, and then I turned my wheel towards him, and then I just hit, and I fell to the ground. So that was my hardest fall. Fortunately, it's not a big fall, but um, but yeah, because of the pedals, because I'm stuck to the pedals, I'm just like going with the bike. There's yeah, that, you know, that's something people don't even think about that the the skill it takes to actually just take your foot in and out when it's the when it's that like what do you call that clip in system or right. whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's something you don't even think about. Because mm-hmm. yeah, most people are afraid of, of of it, but once you get past the fear of like the confidence of knowing how to, get is it really in and that out, difficult? No, I mean, it's just going to take you, like, a few tries to, like, get the hang of it and know, like, the angle, when to unclick and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, after that, then you're just set to, like, be able to utilize the pedals or utilize the cleats to, like, be able to, like, get you riding faster and better. So, all in all, how much have you spent on your biking gear? Uh, Maybe, like, probably, like, a thousand bucks, maybe. Like a thousand, a hundred dollars, maybe. And you feel like you got your money's worth. Oh yeah, most definitely. Yeah. I mean, that comes down to me and how much I've used it. You know, you can buy the bike and not use it, so you feel like you didn't get your money's worth. So that just comes down to you and how much you ended up riding it. And the ultimate goal with that is Ironman competition. Triathlon, yeah. How long do you have to ride the bike for in an Iron Man triathlon? Like 126 miles, I think. Because it goes swimming miles. first, then yeah. biking, right? So I think swimming is like about a three-mile swim or a two-and-a-half-mile swim. I can't remember exactly. But then you get into the bike, which is 120, 25 miles. Now how long does that take? 125 yeah. miles. Well, I mean, so if it takes you an hour and a half or 25 miles, that's times five like five it's, hours that's five see five 150 six hours that's like seven hours yeah huh? i didn't realize triathlons go on for that long or they go at a faster pace i mean no yeah it's like about that you're like looking at like 11 hours to be on a triathlon really because then, then, then they run, run and they, they run after you ever, is it a full marathon it's a full marathon oh my god full full iron man yeah. you want to put yourself through that huh why because <laughs> Cause what? Cause I want to like test my my ability to see how far I can go. And did you feel that way before the cancer? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, that did probably do a good amount of like um, influence, a big influence of like pushing myself. But but I think I just always had like a sense of like wanting to see how far I can go with with myself and whatever it is that I do. Hmm. So you mentioned that Iron Man was your favorite superhero. Superhero? Why is that? Uh, to me, I really liked Iron Man for the sake of like he is a hero because of his own skill set, I guess, because of what he provides to being his his uh, persona is comes down to him being the one that created the suit him being the one that's behind it all and and doing the the acts of like saving the world in his own way were you an iron man fan before the movie started coming out yeah i was and so so you're legit when the first movie came out that's when i was like oh i'm for sure an iron man fan. so you were already reading comics at that point i was not reading comics Ah, so it was really the movies that got you into it well before the movies i just liked the hero um himself because of like me knowing or hearing about his story and then until maybe like three years ago is when i got into the comics or four years ago so it was really the this is like you liked the the concept of iron man you'd heard about it and then when you saw the movie that was just yeah it was really that confirmed i enjoyed the cinematography and the film itself the story was really very appealing are you able to turn off your filmmaker brain when you watch movies no you can't huh no but i mean like i can i can watch things passively but i'm always actively watching it and seeing like why why is it doing what it's doing and how is it achieving that effect do you think that stops you from enjoying movies no, completely i think it makes me value it more really yeah because then it's like well like i get to see like if they delivered it well 
So like it's like, oh, I know they wanted me to feel confused here or surprise me. And it's like me being able to observe what the setup was like and then compared to the payoff, then it's like it's really it's rewarding to be able to it's for see me, that. that definitely I leave my brain at the door whenever I watch. Oh, that's a great. Movie. That's hard. I don't know. I actually I find it really easy. Oh, that's good. I'm, I'm very good at compartmentalizing that's things. Good. It drives my wife crazy. That's good. <laughs> but yeah, Why I can is she really into just, it or what? No, because it's just um, it's a it's you know I've been with my wife for see I'm I'm forty. We're going on fifteen years. Mm, wow. And you know one Congrats. thing I've learned about being with her for that long is there really is a difference between men and women. Uh huh. Yeah. Even as well as we know each other. Yeah. Our brains really work differently, and uh-huh. one of the things that men do really well that drive women crazy is that compartmentalize carp it's a hard word to say compartmentalize please go ahead say it say it compartmentalize compartmentalize Uh that's one thing that drives them crazy Uh because to them everything is connected there's no such thing as keeping things separate but Uh for guys no we can put our emotions to the side or we can put that to the side it doesn't Mm -hmm. really matter right now Mm kind of like what you did with your whole cancer story right Mm -hmm. you said you know what like the emotions Mm. it's definitely legit but what good is it going to do if I just drown in them, right? Mm-hmm. Let's just do what we have to do and let's just put that to the side. Exactly. So that, yeah, that drives a woman crazy. So I can't say all men can do it. Oh, uh, but, but um, like, that's all I got to say. On the average, a lot of men can, but more, mm. more so than women. But yeah, so I, that's my approach, you know, when I watch movies too. Like, take that filmmaker side out, yeah. just leave it to the side. And just enjoy it as it is as fans. So like and a lot of these. That's unfortunate because the filmmaker is the one that wants to see the movies, and you leave them outside. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like, I like just watching uh-huh. as a fan. I mean, the, for me, it allows me to enjoy movies more. Don't get me wrong; I can definitely appreciate when no, something's done definitely. really well. Right, right, right. Like, oh my god, I can't believe that that's the way that story went. I didn't right. see that coming. I was like, uh-huh. they set that up so beautifully, so, yeah. or. Or just any like Roger Deakins movie, right? You can't you can't help but notice the cinematography. It's just uh-huh. there in your face how good it is, uh-huh. right? But for me, yeah, I, I just find leaving all that technical stuff at the door and That's just enjoying good. it as and being just you know in the in the now in the present right. and just enjoying the story for and what it is. That's 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 the hard part for filmmakers because that's we want to experience it just the same way our audience is experimenting it in order to fully like take it in. But it's just hard once you're on the inside. Yeah, because you know, because if to me, if you leave that film or your brain on. You know, you like I do. I do see it, like because my wife lo- loves watching like uh, NCIS or just TV shows in general. Mm-hmm. But like, if you know, if you know how to write scripts, you can see what's coming. It's like okay, mm-hmm. they're setting this up. They're uh-huh. setting that up. I know what's going to happen there. Right. So it's like it takes the fun out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. like, so to me, it's it is essential to turn the brain off, and that's why yeah, like all those comic book movies. Even though I know they're going to be mad, I'll still watch them in the theater. Uh-huh. Because I'm a big time comic book nice. nerd, uh, nice. you know, and I feel like it's for me going to the movie theaters. I really try to go out of my way to watch, you know, something with a lot of visual effects in it or nice. something that's action because I feel like that is like the theater experience, right? If you watch mm-hmm. those movies in the theater, it's going to be a completely different experience if you do it at home. I have not seen The Tenant, but I heard The Tenant just won the Oscar for Best Visual Effects. Really? Because I, f- I feel Did like there's it? been like lukewarm reviews to that. I or mean, just, mind you, I don't really care about reviews. Uh-huh. If I'm interested in a movie, I'll go watch yeah. it no matter what. Because I'm uh-huh. not a, I don't put much stock into film critics. Mm-hmm. Anyway, but yeah, so you know, more drama-driven story narrative movies. I mean, that's it's kind of sad. I tend not to watch them in the theater. Mm-hmm. Like, I can, I can watch that at home on Netflix mm-hmm, or on mm-hmm. HBO Max or anything because I feel like I would still get... I'm sure I'm not going to get 100% of the experience because, right, right. you know, when you have a screen that big and the sound system is that loud. Yeah, yeah it's obviously going to be different, but you can get a lot of it still, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, the, the emotions can still hit you. Right. Whereas if I'm watching Avengers on my TV here versus in the theater, you're really missing out. No, yeah. And a lot... I remember I would, when I was going to... F- taking those film classes, I would tell them that my fellow film students that and they would give me so much shit about it. Oh, you like those Marvel movies? What the uh-huh. hell is wrong with you? What kind yeah. of a filmmaker are you? T- yeah. 
I, I find them very entertaining. They say that, but then when they start working on a set for Marvel, they're yeah. like, oh, look at me. I'm working for Marvel. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to me, like, you know, these superhero movies, they're basically morality plays, right? right? It's uh-huh. good versus evil. Right. There's there's good story to be found in it. Like, right. one of my favorite uh, Marvel movies is Captain America Winter mm. Soldier. Mm. I hear that one's really oh, good. Oh, man. I mean, I thought that was just so well done. But just the conflict between doing the right thing, but also he's got this friend that he kind of, like, doesn't remember him. And at the end, he... Well, there's no real spoiler. Like, the movie's old at this point. You guys know how it ends, right? But... Where he has to make the choice, you know, do I kill my best friend in order to stop him to succeed in my mission? Mm-hmm. Or do I take the chance and no, I'm not going to kill him. I think he might still remember me. And you know what? I don't want to sacrifice my morals, my friendship. I'm going to take the chance. If you want to kill me, then kill yeah. me. Mm-hmm. Right? So there's like really moving parts in no, these. Definitely. And because, you know, there's such high stakes, the emotions are really ramped up. So mm-hmm. I get a lot out of these mm-hmm. movies. But you talk to anyone... Probably anybody in like film school right now, they're gonna gonna just trash these movies all over the place because that's the popular thing to do. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, to me, I really enjoyed seeing the which one was it? Endgame, where Iron Man dies. Spoiler alert! Come on, it's been. I don't know if it was part one or part two, but like when they all like came to attack Thanos together uh, collectively. At the end. Uh, was that the second one? Yeah, that's the second one. So in that scene, I just like. I really enjoyed, and this is what I liked from Avengers, the first movie, was that it felt like a comic book. Like, when you're watching that movie, the cinematography would take you from one character's action and then jump into another one, as if in a comic book, you'd be um, getting taken from one storyboard to the next storyboard with, like, a cross action or a cross character making their way over because they were able to like jump across from each other and that's what avengers the first one felt like and in this scene specifically i really was gravitated to it and i was in awe because it reminded me of like uh like oil paintings that were depicting of like mythology right or like i don't don't know the right era or theme or term but like those oil paintings that we like see these like angelic heroes being in action or doing something and we saw them as our modern heroes and gods uh, all together in this one big like land uh, panorama of this e- enormous battle and it's not just a, a, a picture panorama it's like you end up going inside and you get to see in clear detail like all these actions and these alliances and like all the women hero coming together and making a a statement of like their importance to the team itself and yeah what did you think about that moment because there's there's a lot of people out there that's like come on it's like to look because there's people out there oh my god that's so heavy-handed it's like so obvious and then there's people actually complain about that moment i i I really enjoyed it i thought it was really cool Mm -hmm. that it was like thank you like this this is really awesome to be able to see them all just like just just you know just do their part into the (laughs) battle that's just like every other hero is doing their part but it's like them coming together it's also showing that you know they can take care of themselves just as much as yeah i guess for me because like i you know i am a big comic book guy and i didn't be i know these characters so well that moment would have worked better if they didn't have Captain Marvel there. Because mm. Captain Marvel just destroyed a whole entire ship by herself, right? Oh, yeah. And then the whole point, oh, yo, she needs backup. No, she doesn't. Right. Uh-huh. So if they did that without her, then uh-huh. like, oh, yeah, that's great. Uh-huh. But the fact that they did with her, it's just that's where it felt heavy handed to me. It's like, okay, it's coming, kind of becoming obvious what you guys are trying right. to achieve at this moment, which is woman power. I can't remember the, the scene exactly, but. Yeah, so I do. I remember it exactly. So. Was there moments where they needed help, and then like that's where like they no, no. So the, the, what happens is, uh, so Captain Marvel literally just destroyed the ship on her own, and uh-huh. Peter Parker is getting swarmed uh-huh. by Thanos's army, right? And Captain Marvel comes in and saves Peter Parker, 
And you know, she says, "Hey, Peter Parker, you know, why don't you give me that? I'll help you. I'll I'll take it from here." Mm-hmm. And he goes, "Oh, but how are you gonna get through all the, that whole army?" Mm-hmm. And then then that's where that big woman, she goes, "Oh, she's not alone." And all these women uh, come in. Right. It's like she just took down that big alien ship right, by herself. Right, I right. think she can handle it, right? All right. So that's where it's not a believable moment mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. That's where you can feel, like I said, where you can feel the heavy hand of, "Okay, we're trying to have a politically correct moment here." Right. Whereas I feel where it was done better. Do you watch The Mandalorian? Ah, uh, The Mandalorian. I watched, I think, the first season. I so in the second season, it. they had a very similar. They had a similar moment on the last episode, but it was done very well because it wasn't over the top. It was mm. very subtle. There, there wasn't any of this like, "Oh, we got this. We don't need any help." Thing. Was there a moment was, of disadvantage? Yeah, it was. No, it was just a moment where it just. You, they don't even call it out. It just happened to be four women, mm. and they just happen to be kicking ass. And to me, that's all you need to do. Mm-hmm. You know, you just, it's like it comes back to you said, it is a visual medium. You right. don't need to say it, just right, show right, it. Right. It's so uh-huh. much more effective that right. way. And so that's what the man, that was the Mandalorian's approach to it. And to right. me, that was much more effective. But knowing knowing Marvel and knowing that Disney's behind him and everything, yeah, exactly. And That's yeah. who their their audience is. It kind of needs to be served on a platter. But you know what? Disney's behind Star Wars too, now, right? Mm-hmm. They bought the whole you know Lucasfilms True. division, so that True. that's a Disney product as well. I, to I me, agree. it was just a better way to do that. Right. I mean, I feel like it's more of a mature audience for the Mandalorian, in my opinion. I just feel like... Oh, you just hurt my feelings, man. I mean, I'm saying like... <laughs> if, if you were to get statistics involved, there's probably a much more, more of a percentage of children watching The Avengers versus The Mandalorian is all I got to say. <laughs> probably. Probably. I, you know what? I bet you... I bet you it's not that far off. I bet you there's I a lot of adults that support those Avengers movies more than kids. True. That have the money to be actually right. going to. Do. But I think percentage-wise. Percentage-wise, probably. That, yeah, that's yeah, where, yeah. where I'm leaning towards, mm. not actual quantity. I know, but do you think somehow if the, that that message wouldn't be absorbed by the kids if they... If they didn't say it? No, I think they would. It would still they be absorbed, right? right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, uh, that's where... But to I me, think that's for them the to be is. safe, they end up doing these safe things of like making sure that it gets the idea across, unfortunately, mm-hmm. that that's how it has to be approached. Because some people or producers might be like, yo, yeah, we, we see it happening, but like we need to hear it. Like that's just how it's going to go for this scene. I'm sorry, guys. And then all, all of us being like, you don't need to. Like it's... It's clear as day as to what's happening or what's being being shown, but that's just you know that it. I mean, it depends. Like I, I'm just going from my assumption. I don't know how the production went about, but I would yeah, be. I can only imagine. Surprised. Yeah, because mm-hmm. I can only imagine because that definitely happens. You know, in the client world, when you're making videos for clients, that happens, and in the agency world too. In my experience, that happens mm-hmm. a lot. Mm-hmm. As well, so I can only imagine when there's hundreds of million dollars put being put into a movie, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, it is very much a politically correct world these days, and everyone's all about social justice, and they're worried about doing like being wrong in any way whatsoever, and mm-hmm. they don't want any social justice outcries. I could definitely see that being the case. That no, we mean we need to make this very clear that this is a woman power mm-hmm. moment right here. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I just, I mean, it sounded like a broken record to me. It just it's just bad filmmaking. Mm-hmm. And that's you know, that's the point where my filmmaking brain will just come out of nowhere because it's just so <laughs> obvious to me. And, and, and then your and fanboy yeah, fan yeah. comes out and yeah, then yeah, they're yeah, fighting yeah, each yeah, other. No, this video takes me out of them. No, I mean, I'm still enough of a fanboy that it, it won't stop me from enjoying it, but it's just it does take me out of it a little bit because all of a sudden I'm aware of what's going on right. here and what's being done. It's I, like, I feel like your filmmaker persona is the one that's like swinging. And then your fanboy is the one that has its hand on the forehead, <laughs> just like holding it back down. <laughs> oh, this is a good way to put it. All right, all right, so good. This is a good place to end it here. We've been going for two hours, two dude. Two hours? We could keep going for more, yeah. but I know there's not enough time in the world for our conversations. No, I mean, honestly, I could keep going too. You want to keep going? I mean, no, it's up, it's up to you. I mean, like, two no, hours I, I is need a long two, time. Two hours is a good time. Well, two hours is a good time. Honestly, you know, the podcast that I like listening to, like Joe Rogan Experience, mm-hmm. you listen to Joe Rogan and all? Mm-hmm. His, on average, are three hours. Well, 
Yeah, you know what I like? What I like about him, he's kind of like me. You see a picture of him there on my wow, you are on my my I'm vision so board there. Well. well, you know what it is. Why why I have a picture of him specifically? There's he's made he's made an empire for himself by just pursuing the things that he really cares about: mm-hmm. martial arts, MMA, commenting, stand up comedy, and podcasting. Fear factor. Oh. No fear factor. <laughs> That was just a that was just a means to an end for him. He he mm. fully admits that he hated it, but at I'm that sure. point in his comedy career, it's like he knew if he took that job on, that would give him fuck you money. Right? You and familiar publicity. with that term, fuck you money? No. So if what fuck you money is basically when you have enough money to just say fuck you to the opportunities that you're not interested in oh, that see. you would say yes yeah. to before because you need the money. Right, right, right. right. So you can say fuck you to that. That way, that gives you the freedom to just pursue only what you want. Right. Mm-hmm. And so because of that fuck you money from Fear Factor, he was able to be to build this, you know, this MMA commenting um, career, right. stand up right. and podcasting. He just out of those three things, he's made an empire for That's himself. Good. I mean, he has to be thankful for Fear Factor. He was a stable for the show and it got him so much attention. Yeah, too, yeah, exactly. That's right? all I knew. Him so, yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. So he he used that as just like his like I said, that was his fuck you money mm-hmm. though, that allowed him to focus on just podcast, stand up. And UFC commenting, and then everything right. else, he just said "fuck you" to. Right. So uh, to me, that's why he's kind of he's the ideal, because uh-huh. that's kind of what I'm doing now. I'm just yeah. focusing on only what I want to do. I'm not right. really doing client work anymore. Mm-hmm. That I'm just trying to build my do, audience do now you, on you you and have, YouTube. And do you have a lot of "fuck you" money? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I want to say it's a lot, but um, right now I don't have to. But it's enough for you to get your your stuff going that you want to do. Yeah. Exactly. Nice. It's enough where I don't have to take that's on work good. that I don't want to. See? And, and I think that's, again, like when it comes to like making the leap to you, the direction you want to go and then stop doing the work that you don't really want to do. It's just having at least a financial oh, it's a big security part of it. to then like get involved into what you no, want to do. It's definitely a big part of it. I don't know. Definitely it won't, it won't last forever. And, you know, I might start having to do because the thing is, you know what really changed it for me was I realized I wanted to start heading in this direction about two years ago. Because, mm-hmm. you know, I, I was already doing my own thing. I was having client work, but I would always split it up with, okay, you know what? I'll take a full-time job at a production house for like a year and a half. Like, you know, I did real estate videos for a year and a half. Then I did my time at a production company for like eight months. And then I did my time at the agency for a year but they were just kind of more like stopovers between me really doing my own thing which is what i always wanted but where it really got cemented to me that i'm not of like nine to five kind of guy Mm -hmm. is when i was working at the agency and we had hired a freelancer to because you know we're just doing so many projects man sometimes you just get too busy Mm -hmm. you have deadlines to meet you need to hire freelancers to help with editing and we hired this one guy, and a really nice guy. I won't say his name. I don't want to throw him under the bus because I really do like him. But we hired him to do this After Effects project because neither me or the other video, we just didn't have time for it. And so he's working on it for three days from Wednesday to Friday. And it was kind of my bad. I hadn't really checked up on him because I just assumed because my the agency had hired him before that okay they wouldn't hire him if he didn't know what he's doing mm-hmm. I'm sure he's got it covered and then when I checked his work on Friday oh my god it was complete shit mm-hmm. it was like we could not hand that to the client at all and this project was due the next week I think it was due Monday right? and I'm checking here like the end of day of Friday what his work was like and it, it's not mm-hmm. I couldn't so I ended up covering because you know what? It was my fault. I should have checked up on him mm-hmm. right from the get-go to see how I was mm-hmm. doing. So I spent my entire weekend working on this project that I just didn't enjoy at all. It's essentially, it was a glorified animated PowerPoint presentation for a city down south. They're doing a state of their city, like kind of like the president does a state of the union. Mm-hmm. They were doing a state of the city, except it was an After Effects animated mm-hmm. presentation. I spent my whole weekend doing that thing. The whole weekend. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about four or five hours. Mm-hmm. Like literally like the whole weekend. Hours maybe? <laughs> yeah, because it, it it was a lot of work. It was all right. After Effects mm-hmm. animations, and I just couldn't believe. Here I am spending 48 hours of my existence, on a project I couldn't give two shits about, mm-hmm. and what am I getting in return? I'm getting you know like, like a meager paycheck, okay at mm-hmm. best, right? 
like in the long run the trade off is just it doesn't it doesn't mm-hmm. add up to me right so that's where you know it really cemented to me okay i need to i need to find some way to get out of this kind of system this full time mm-hmm. job system right. right and then about half like 6 months into my agency job my car broke down and i ended up needing to get another car and i got a prius and when i got that prius that opened up a whole other option to me because all of a sudden with the you know i'm getting 45 to 40 miles per gallon that makes me so happy saying that i love that mm-hmm. car cuz mm-hmm. before that i drove a 96 Isuzu Trooper getting 15 miles per gallon wow. i was spending almost 300 bucks a month on gas alone yeah, right that's a lot. so when i got that prius i realized oh you know what i could actually quit my job at the agency and just drive uber Mm-hmm. make my own schedule and i could bring in a guaranteed amount of money every month but i'd still have more time to do my own thing mm-hmm. so that's what it did for me and mm-hmm. then you know and then at that point my wife chris she she had just started her nonprofit, smart city smart ct which she's leading the charge for smart cities in the philippines wow. basically right so it just it became an easy decision it's like what am i gonna do i'm gonna keep using my skill set for this agency and all I get out of it is a paycheck and they benefit so much more from right. my skills right. where I can use my skill set to help my wife's nonprofit and myself. So mm-hmm. it became, it was like it was an easy decision at that point. Mm-hmm. And like I said, then the Prius is what made that all possible because all of a sudden I could just do Uber and I could still support the two of us and still have more time to do go after what I want. Of course... You know, life has a funny way. We went to the Philippines because we, her nonprofit is based there, and we we split. We're starting to split our year between the Philippines and the states. And when we're in the Philippines, the whole COVID pandemic happens. We get stuck there for four months, and of course, because of COVID, Uber over here just dies. Right, essentially, it's like, oh shit, there goes my whole plan. Right. Mm-hmm. So when I came back here. I started doing DoorDash, and actually DoorDash is enough too. Nice to to cover all of our expenses mm-hmm. and essentially set my own schedule, and I can really focus on doing what I want. So nice. it's not that I had fuck you money, mm-hmm. but I had I had a a way out where I could still take care of all the necessities, mm-hmm. but really focus on what matters to me more. Right. Mm-hmm. And then like luck kicked in, you know unemployment before freelancers like us self-employed we never mm-hmm. qualified for it and because mm-hmm. of covid they came out with pua the pandemic unemployment assistance mm-hmm. and we all of a sudden self-employed people qualify for our unemployment mm-hmm. right and so I, I applied for that and i nice. got that and then because of the extra 600 mm-hmm. that you were getting every week and mine right. was backlogged until i think last week of february wow. mm-hmm. dude i got a ton of money wow yeah and that's where the fuck you money yeah. came <laughs> So ever since then, <coughs> it was just focusing full time on right. mm-hmm. trying to build my own thing on YouTube. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's good. I'm happy to hear that, and I'm happy. I'm excited to see this grow, and hopefully, you know, it continues. Well, the thing is, like, I knew it's growing so slow, and I knew it'd be that way. But you know, I'm not gonna lie; it definitely hurts. You know, you hope it would grow faster, especially when you feel like you're putting out good content, mm-hmm. right? But the thing with YouTube is it's really it's really a long-term game. It's a marathon, you know, until that mm-hmm. algorithm really starts taking over for you. Because right, right, right. if you think about it, I don't know what the exact stat is, like millions of channels are started every day. Mm-hmm. So it makes sense that for the YouTube algorithm, they're not going to just start pushing out your content. Right. So they they, they want to see if you're actually sticking around and putting it on a consistent basis. Mm-hmm. Like um, Vita Eats, you know, where I do talk tours with my buddy Sam. I don't know if I told you this, but the first year he did it, he had like around 225 subscribers. Mm -hmm. And then just in the first four months alone of this year, he's already over 500. So he doubled his growth in four months because the algorithm really. People love their tacos. I know people love their tacos, but the the algorithm's starting to take Mm -hmm. over. That SEO's finally starting to take over so it is mm. you know it's it's a long-term game and it's you know i'll be honest like sometimes i look at the numbers and you know you definitely doubt it and you question it, like mm. fuck is this you know am i doing the right thing here is mm. this actually gonna happen but 
that's where the podcasts kind of save me because of the intros I do for these podcasts, mm-hmm. right? Because, you know, the weekly vlog, the Boba Diaries, the reviews, filmmaking-wise, it doesn't really take much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the talking heads for the film, for the vlog, I make it look nice and mm-hmm. everything. But, you know, the rest of the vlog, I just shoot it with my iPhone and the Boba mm-hmm. Diaries is all iPhone. Mm-hmm. It's not, I'm not practicing any real, like, filmmaking techniques or skills right, right, right. but with the intros for these podcasts that's where i get to continue to express that mm-hmm. and develop that so let's say even if the youtube audience never grows but at least my skill set still kept them growing oh, definitely and my portfolio kept on growing in the way that i wanted it to which mm-hmm. is even more important for that's us smart. right yeah exactly so who knows maybe if i ever go back to doing client work or who knows maybe i go back to an agency or a production house at least my skill set didn't stay still and my portfolio didn't right. stay still. No, right? exactly. And then mm-hmm. hopefully those clientele is just, you know, continue working with you and want to have more work from you. Hopefully, but you know what? I've never had much luck with that. And I have I think definitely, and this is something we talked about when we were scouting, my weakness is the networking aspect of it, right? Mm-hmm. And I know you couldn't believe it at first because, yeah, when we were talking one-on-one yeah. or just in person. You knew everybody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm, talking, I'm chatting it up. I'm mm-hmm. cracking jokes with everyone. Yeah. But it's really the keeping the the, the connection, connection alive, right? Mm-hmm. That, that's that's where I have mm-hmm. it's my Achilles heel. And I feel like you're mm-hmm. a lot better than that than I am. Mm-hmm. Would you say that's fair to say? I feel like I, I do try to keep my uh, effort trying to at least just like chime in here and there and see uh how i can be of an assistance to people at least and then if people need my help then we end up working on something together and if not well at least me reaching out they and they kind of had me in the back of their mind knowing that i can i can be there for them what do you think that comes from this approach of yours because you really seem to be approaching everything Correctly, honestly, I mm. I really see you becoming a successful filmmaker, much more successful than me. That's no, for sure. I hope so. I mean, Excuse me. um, I don't know. I just feel like the main thing is like with the people that are again in my stage of filmmaking, we're all just trying to be able to express our crafts and be able to get better and, um we should be there for one another in order to help each other get that opportunity to do so. And so, I mean, that's, that's all I can ask for. And then I can only uh, do my best to like put myself out there to help people in the long run. Cause it's like, at least if I don't make anything for me personally, well, at least I can be there for other people and work on these amazing projects and, and have that. And then, if they know that I'm there for them, then hopefully they can be there for me when I am in need of assistance. So, for example, then, let's talk about your latest project, uh, Swept Away. It's got swept. Swept. Mm-hmm. Did you have um, a hard time getting people on board for that? For no, not there was at all. There was no pay at all, right? Uh, no. So, like, uh, we were, like, on a very low budget obviously yeah everything just went towards the the production the production itself itself. yeah yeah a lot of it went to bring in the piano to the stage really (laughs) yeah but that was just because we had to get a move truck to move it and store it and stuff like that but um no i mean like we have been able to like be all like a collaborative of people who are willing to um support each other and support me support the singer into creating um a project uh just as great as we ended up uh, making it and uh again like the turnout the quality of how it came how it is and how it looks proves to you how hard everyone like worked to get it to that uh caliber i guess and um you know we're all I wanted all of us to be able to at least feel like we're getting something beneficial out of it at least. And I made sure that, you know, the, I did my homework and I did all the stuff that I needed to do in order to make their jobs easier for them to just have to worry about their jobs and make sure they don't have to worry about things not being in place, things not, um, happening the way they should be. So if I, 
did all that in pre-production, then production would just go smoothly for them and everybody would just have a much better experience on set and not have to stress and feel like they don't want to do this again. And um, everyone, some friends acted in it and um, they just did their best to try to like um, help us with getting this video to be as good as it can be or as good as it is. When you're asking people, because this is a fear, I wouldn't say fear, but this is a hesitation I have when, you know, trying to get people to help me with projects is, because mm -hmm. I, like, I wouldn't say oftentimes, but, you know, sometimes I just need an extra pair of hands and I feel mm -hmm. like this person's so highly skilled. I mm -hmm. don't want to waste their time with this, you know, right, like right, if right. basically all I need is a PA, is, is that something that... You run into I mean, it all? I mean, I'm sure that that was a concern of mine, but I, again, like uh, I feel like I've done my best to be there for everyone who has helped me, in order for it to be easier for me to ask a favor of oh, them. So you would do anything for them too, basically. Like You've I, done anything I had for a, them. Yeah, like if they needed help on stuff, I do my best to go out of my way and 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 whether help them. Whether it's PA, whether, whether it's, it's camera, op. whether it's picking up a department for their film in order to help them, whether it's referring them to other jobs, if I can do them, or if I hear that they're looking for a specific person in this department, like all of that stuff, like me, um, you know, doing my best to, to support them. It's like, hopefully I can't expect them or anybody to, to return the favor, but hopefully I can receive that favor from the people that I'm, um, helping and uh so far it seems like the community we have in film has been very like loyal and committed to help one another out when it comes to like uh individual projects if we need hands or gear we'll be there for each other or if like recently a friend of mine and my dp actually got robbed in oakland and so like oh, man. his gear got stolen so it's like we've been there to like helpfully uh help help him finance his the recovery kit? of that stuff. I think he had his camera on him and stuff, but like all everything else, like an AC gear and I don't know what else he had, but he had a laptop too that he lost and all these other valuable items that he had. And so again, it's like uh if if one of us goes down, we're all going we're all hurt. And so we wanna be there for one another to to help each other uh still be on our feet. And so, yeah, it mainly comes down to just being there for one another and and showing each other our loyalty and commitment. So you basically you don't have any reservations then about asking, like, say, like this DP friend of yours, you know, you need help on a project, but you don't need him as a DP. You need him more as just like, and basically almost like a PA. Well, that depends. Like if if he has better projects to work on, then I'd consider getting somebody else to do the task. Um, and if that's not his department, then I'd try to like consider the people who do kind of professionalize in that department in order to help me. And again, for them, if they can't do the department, but I'm not going to really expect a DP to do a department that he, he's So you not, would ask someone else? Who's, who's like geared towards that direction or who at least wants to learn if, if that is the case. Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. All right, let's end it here. I gotta pee pretty bad. So yeah, Orlando, those tacos got. <laughs> in I mean, my how, mind. how can people find your stuff online? What do, what do yeah, you so do? like, if you guys want to follow my production page, OT Cinema is the uh, Instagram, and www.otcinema.com is my um, website. Uh, if you want to follow like my personal journey when it comes to cycling and. That triathlon fun stuff then ot cinema 707 is my instagram handle for that but yeah hopefully i can have you guys uh see swept which is releasing may 1st 2019 which is yeah, it's a lot sooner than i was expecting it's gonna be <laughs> amazing once once yeah look up this song online on spotify just from, yeah. from what i heard is like a little bit of the hook even listening her to voice it, sounds yeah, it amazing gives you, it gives you like that soul vibe with like a a female group type of style kind of like a bit of dream girls 1920s just yeah from, exactly and that's, mm -hmm. and that's why you came up with a video that way right just it made you made you immediately it inspired think about it, huh? me yeah to do this and we both are very passionate about the the, the aesthetic behind this era and 
No, speaking speaking of your website, because I was checking it out mm. earlier before you came, you aware that you're still pushing yourself out there as an assistant editor? Uh yeah. Yeah, because it says assistant editor. Right. On the I top have of it on the website. I have it on the top just yeah. because it's been what's financially um supporting me mm-hmm. at the moment. And it's it's something I'm currently doing, so it's just like my title. Okay, so it was intentional. It wasn't that you had an updated. Journal. No, yeah, it's intentional, and mm-hmm. it's just hard to like label me as all these other things when people like, if if I'm getting hired for like right now like a specific department, then that's just like my current label at the moment. I wonder if it almost be smart to just have a different website for all your different skill sets. Right? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, but you like, got our you know Landa Torres the AE website. I just put one website and put yeah. different tabs. Like, yeah, what do you yeah, want me yeah. for? What do you need? Or, yeah, and then yeah, just yeah. go into that tab. I mean, that'd be like one great way to avoid being labeled as one thing too, right? You mm-hmm. have a dedicated website for your gaffer right. stuff. Yeah. You have a dedicated website for your editing stuff uh-huh. and a dedicated website for your directing. That'd be cool. That actually, that's that'd actually amazing. a pretty... I that down. yeah that's actually a pretty good idea to avoid you know being labeled as right. one thing uh-huh. i'll just put a swiss army knife as my logo <laughs> that way it makes more sense i mean that, that is essentially how it like, coming up especially these days mm-hmm. in filmmaking and basically you come out as you have to come out as a swiss army knife mm-hmm. it's really hard to well, it's specialize at the beginning mm-hmm because you do end up taking up so much on your own all right i'm being a liar here i said we were gonna end it and it's not ending all right that's it thanks for listening and watching folks gotta go pee now (laughs) and we recorded the whole thing too all right